G'day mate, Forty here. So I notice when when I go on a new medication and I talk about it with, with people, the, the most common r response or question that I get is what are the side effects? And so if you just Google side effects, right? Almost everything that comes up is to do with the uh, medication. So let me just put in side effects right now. And all, all the top results have to do with medication, an effect of a drug or other type of treatment, definition of side effects. Okay, there was a movie by Steven Soderbergh. Oh, another 2013 side effects, brilliant psychological thriller. Okay, kind of undercuts. Okay, this, this largely undercuts my point. But uh, finding and learning about side effects to do with medication, drug side effects, side effects, medical news today, medication type of effects, side effects, uh, movie, side effects of medication, side effects summary, side effects on Netflix, side effects song, side effects game. But uh, in usual discourse, side effects seems to primarily revolve around drugs, medication. But uh, what about the side effects of everything else? Like for everything, there is a side effect. There's the opportunity cost, what you could be doing otherwise with the money and the time and the effort that you're expending on a particular endeavor. All right. There are the people that you come into contact with with this particular endeavor and the effect that they have on your life. So mainly opportunity cost, monetary cost, and the people that you encounter, those are the, the main side effects of, of anything that you engage in. But uh, what about mindfulness, right? Mindfulness, wellness, exercise, drinking water, all these are great things, right? But there are all sorts of side effects that can come from drinking too much water, right? Reduces sodium in your body, uh, can kill you if you drink too much water. Uh, exercise, people tend to focus more on getting certain amounts of exercise done. And most people don't put much emphasis into how they're doing the exercise. So frequently when people exercise, they are ingraining bad habits. And often the damage that they're doing to themselves by ingraining bad habits outweighs any benefits that they're, they're getting. And they're, they're doing far more damage to themselves often by engaging in, for example, jogging, right? Jogging puts a lot of strain on our connective tissue. And for many people over 30, over 40, jogging causes injury, uh, working out, all sorts of different things that people do for exercise, right? Because they put more emphasis on the exercise itself and accomplishing certain exercise goals. They will ingrain bad habits of tension, compression, pulling down, pulling in, straining. It's one of the, the downsides of goals in general. When you set goals, all right, you attempted to take shortcuts and you are less likely to weigh up and to think about the, the consequences. And so you, you set a goal of doing X amount of exercise or you set whatever goal it is, and it narrows your choices in your mind, and you become tempted to cheat to achieve your goals, and you may not be as aware of the, the damages that you're doing to yourself. So these thoughts started coming to me after I watched a video on does mindfulness meditation work for ADHD, and there is a meager amount of evidence that mindfulness has some beneficial effects on ADHD, but there's in contemporary discourse anyway, there is no talk about what are the what are the side effects of mindfulness, right? People talk about the side effects of medication, but what are the side effects of trying to do things naturally? So what I want to point out here, however, is that in my newsletter back about five years ago, I encouraged experts in the field to write about the adverse events that were occurring in psychosocial treatment programs for ADHD because nobody was talking about them. Hardly any researchers measured them. And yet, like medication, we should have a responsibility to assess potential side effects of our psychosocial treatments because they're there. We've known that they've been out there for decades, but somehow psychologists and others working in the field of mental health think that their interventions are benign. Yeah, whether they work or not, they don't do any harm. And that's not true. What we showed in these eight different articles was that there are significant side effects for a significant minority of individuals. 10 to 20% or more of people experience adverse events. And I asked John and Lydia to write about this when it comes to their program of mindfulness-based interventions. So here's an article from the ADHD Report, uh, my newsletter, and in it, John and Lydia talk about the fact that while, again, researchers in mindfulness weren't asking about or recording side effects that, they, that were being experienced, more recent studies 
began to ask, and guess what they found? A subset of individuals reported that they did have difficulties with this mindfulness-based program. Some reported an increase in, in helplessness over managing their symptoms, like almost becoming overwhelmed by their inattention, perhaps. Others reported that anxiety, depression, even panic attacks and physical symptoms increased as a result of this sort of mindfulness, letting go, letting your attention go, letting it wander. And of course, if you have experienced anxiety, depression, PTSD, or traumatic events, sometimes what happens is when you stop suppressing those memories and you open your mind up to being more attentive to the flow of your ideas, your mind starts to wander into these very painful memories and subjects. And that can be a problem. That's a side effect of mindfulness. So we know from earlier work that we don't want to be doing mindfulness with people with schizophrenia, uh, with PTSD, and maybe even with anxiety because of this potential adverse. So I, I did Kundalini yoga for two years and people would have a, a psychic break. It, it, they would just break down. They would go nuts sometimes doing Kundalini yoga. It wasn't for everyone event that can happen. Uh, other people reported with a adult ADHD that they had trouble with the homework assignments, with the requirement to sit and meditate for so long, which is why you hear John Mitchell and others talking about making this part of your, of your day of mindfulness-based practice, as I said, not just practicing meditation during one period each day. Uh, they also talked about um, people having difficulties with focusing their attention because of others around them or noises in the environment. So they struggled with this idea of keeping your mind on this attention focus that's so much a part of meditation. So their point is that there are side effects. They do occur in a minority of patients, but they occur. They need to be monitored by the therapists who are doing this. And if you, as a client, are going to go in and do mindfulness, you need to pay attention to that and report it to your therapist as well. Mindfulness is not for everybody. But again, I'll reiterate, it looks very promising for adult ADHD. But Right, so there's nothing that comes without side effects, including <laughs> mindfulness including wellness, including chiropractic and yoga. And uh, opportunity cost, right? The, the money that you spend and, and the people that you encounter, right? The, the people that you're placed into proximity with, these, these are the biggest dangers from uh, any endeavor that you take that's likely to come with side effects. We okay, here's, here's are also the discussing the tendency that you of figures in the guru sphere, as they, especially the ones that cultivate a more conservative audience, that they often turn out to, surprise, surprise, have developed a new appreciation for Christian values and religion, right? Now, mm -hmm. yes, their audience also tend to be more religious and find these things valuable, but that's just a coincidence, right? It's really... No, he wasn't talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. He was talking about uh, mindfulness practices such as uh, meditation, All right? So meditation is the most common mindfulness practice. But uh, there are side effects to live streaming. I was just adding up after my conversation with Elliot, like how much has live streaming cost me? And on average, over the past six years, my commitment to live streaming has cost me probably a minimum of $1,000 in my pocket per week, right? I have had significantly less than $50,000 in total annual income due to live streaming. I've also probably offended or damaged friendships, uh, removed the possibility of other friendships, removed the, the possibility of, of dating women, uh, removed the possibility of therefore possibly getting married, having a family, having an honored place in the community. I, but aside from that, it, it's been great. But everything comes with with downsides and side effects, all right? By doing as much live streaming as I have, I have cost myself over the last six years uh, probably a minimum of $300,000 in my pocket uh, after tax. And I'm not aware of my live streaming damaging my real life relationships, but it probably has. And I, I, I'm, I'm kind of lucky in a sense that the, the blessing with my spending so much of my life online and, and producing so many blog posts and, and videos and controversial topics that I've explored online that uh, anyone who's somewhat acquainted with me, they're, they're not going to be shocked by anything that I, I say or do. So maybe the people that are in my life, all right, they've become inured to, to my craziness. But yeah, $1,000 a week, you know, after taxes in my pocket to do a normal amount of live streaming, that's, that's a very significant uh, price to pay. But yeah, I, Andrew Huberman, uh, Joe Rogan, 
a lot of the uh, t tending towards the right wing bloggers are, are finding God because that's what their audience wants to hear. That they've done the intellectual work to consider the issue more thoroughly. So you see this in Huberman has come out discussing his religiosity. He's not perhaps one of the worst offenders, but Russell Brand, more recently discovering Christ and the Bible as very valuable sources. You know, he always had an interest in mysticism and various Eastern traditions and whatnot, but suddenly Christianity, good old Christianity, it's become of appealing. more interest to him. Yeah, more appealing. He, he may have overlooked some of the important insights there. And Constantine Kissin also, he hasn't gone full bore of embracing Christianity, but he has come out at least on his uh, substack and what, declaring his lack of faith in new atheism, right? And his growing appreciation for the importance of religiosity. Maybe he was too quick to dismiss the importance of religion. Who's, you know, Dave Rubin as well. Who was the original cultural Christian? He, he described, oh, um, the English folk. No, the, the, the other English guy. He described himself as a cultural Christian. The strange death of Europe, that guy. Oh, Douglas Murray. Yes, Douglas Murray. We heard him talk with Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Pichot about oh, like, how much he really wants to be capable of, of being religious. But he, the unfortunate thing is, you know, he isn't willing to take the last step because he can't really make himself believe. But he, he really strongly recognizes the importance and beauty of Christianity. So, yes, this is a common theme. It's been playing out for a long time. And if you remember, Matt, we heard the sense makers, Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger and whatnot. In sense maker content, you often hear them talking about the importance of mm. mass, of rituals of, you know, uh, saying grace yeah. before meals, yeah. right? So I would always forget to have my gratitude practice. But when I said, you know what, I'm gonna do this. Before I eat, I'm gonna do my gratitude practice. I'm just gonna bind something that just has this really cool characteristic of being really hard to forget, i.e. eating, with something that's really useful and has a little bit of cultural vector just combine the two. And then it just began to expand from there. So this is, of course, the recreation of ritual. It is also part of the story. Yep. And that's a lot of culture hacking we can do, right? I mean, I mean, no. grace, gratitudes at dinner, um, Shabbos, you know, Sabbath, a day down, a down day every week to reflect and reset. Like these are simple things that are easy to dust off and reanimate. And I really think, again, I think there's a lot that can be open sourced. We just have to make sure that we're not open sourcing the technology. We're open sourcing the technology to in bring into insight. So don't open source the So Jews are known as being pretty cutting edge and leading a lot of social, cultural, economic, uh, political movements, but they also have very traditional practices. So you can belong to a tribe, right? And you can act Amish one day a week, okay? Such as on the, the Sabbath, right? You can be with your in-group and maintain cultural, religious, traditional practices that go back thousands of years, but also have a time, an opportunity in your life where you, you know, take advantage of new technologies. So I, I think for me, a mixture of traditional practice and an openness to what's cutting edge together make for a good life. Oh open source, the things that build developmental capacity, the generative process. They, they don't want to do it religion in the traditional way, but mm. they recognize the kind of deeper metaphorical meaning behind yeah. uh, this is a, This is a really important point, one that you've made before, which is that even Jordan Peterson is not by any standards like a normal Christian. Just like a normal Christian that goes to church, you know, that's basically it. No, they're, they're weird, metaphorical, cultural <laughs> Christians. Like this is like a postmodern version. It's, it's like paleo-Christianity or something. It's a bit like Christian hipsterism. They're into Christianity, but not in the way that you are, right? <laughs> they're into it because it, they've got the deeper meaning, the evolutionary meaning, which is there, the symbolic and metaphorical interpretation. And I heard recently on Trigonometry an echo of this sentiment. So they were talking to Alex O'Connor, the philosopher slash online atheist, and there was this segment. So listen to this. Let's say you were just sort of pretending to be Christian, you're just acting like a Christian, and suddenly there's a, there's a political invasion, a different religion sort of is taking over the country, and they come to you, they hold a gun to your head, and they say, say that Jesus is not God or I'll shoot you. In that moment, you're not going to pretend to be a Christian for the social utility. You're just going to throw it out of me. Yeah, but that's right? not what people mean when they say act like you're a Christian. I don't think going to church is actually what they mean either. What they mean, so for example, we hear every time we have a meal here in the studio, we say grace, mm. right? No, I don't think anyone here is religious. Well, no one who eats here mm. is religious. Um, the woman editing this is religious, so she's <laughs> upset with all three of us. Now, um, so what I think they mean is there are certain practices uh, around religion that will make your life better. Yes. And I think that's definitely true. Uh, the, the constant practicing of gratitude, the appreciation of the fact that you're not the same. Right. So it's not like you can just practice religion and it will automatically make your life better. For many people, right, practicing religion makes their life worse. So for me, right, I frequently look to religion where I should have primarily been looking for other things as a solution to my problems. I should have perhaps been looking at therapy or 12-step programs, medication. I, I, it's very tempting. And I'm talking here when I'm thinking about the downsides of religion, I'm talking about the downsides of high intensity religion. So for most people in America, their Christianity is quite low intensity, but I'm really talking about high intensity religion, such as the Seventh-day Adventism in which I was raised, the Orthodox Judaism, which I currently practice, 
there's, there's high intensity religion, but with that high intensity, there come more bountiful rewards, but also more downsides. So many people become nastier, crueler, meaner, less ethical, less law abiding when they become religious, they become more dangerous. Other people become nicer, finer, kinder, more elevated, more disciplined. So r religion can affect people in many different ways. So I have a type of mind that really loves a magic key. And when, when I've been able to believe that, oh, I've got the magic key to how the world works, and frequently I believe that's, that's found in religion, right? It would, it would narrow my focus. It would close my mind to much of reality, and it would make me uh, quite, quite obnoxious to, to deal with center of the universe, the connection with the transcendent or the divine, the, the recognition that other people are as equal and equally important in the world as you are, uh, the serving of others, all of these things are practices that most religions have developed in one way or another that a secular person is unlikely to, to get themselves into because they're not natural to human beings. It's not natural to put other people ahead of yourself. It's not natural um, to practice gratitude. Most people, particularly in our society, don't, right? So I think what people mean when they say act as if you are religious is adopt some of the, the kind of the best things about religion. And it is an interim answer, by the way because you mentioned children. Once you have children, it becomes very difficult. It's hard to explain to a five-year-old why they should do something without, you know, the bearded man in the sky, which yes. I know religious people will get upset with me about because it's an unfair character, but I use it exactly for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, not, not to mention talking about things like death. Yeah. Well, yeah, so religion can be a vehicle to increase gratitude, but for, for, for me, much of the time, religion became so rote, it didn't really significantly increase my, my gratitude. Uh, religion can make you less selfish, but... Uh, my, my screwed up physiology and psychology uh, did not permit religion as it flowed through me to significantly make me less selfish. I needed years of psychotherapy. I needed medication. I needed 12-step programs. I, I needed other vehicles to get a more proper alignment of myself with reality. So sure, religion can do these benefits that they were just talking about, Constantine Kisson and company, but plenty of religious people don't get these benefits. And proportionally, I think just as many side, uh, secular people have, have the same benefits that are attributed to religion here. So there might you have, like we talked about, the kind of Christian hipsterism, but the, the image of a whole bunch of non-religious people being forced <laughs> to work, is to say, careers before meals because you think, you know, the ritual of gratitude is important. It's so ridiculous. It's, it's so ridiculous. As, as somebody who grew up in a religious household, according to Constantine, I should have received all these values of putting other people's first and, and being kind and so on. He says they don't come naturally. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Like almost all cultures have these values about be kind to people. Don't be rude. Don't be an art. And here's, here's my life experience in this area. I noticed that people over 30 rarely deliberately humiliate other people face to face in public and certainly not people over 40. So when I was bedridden in my 20s, Almost all of my peers shied away from me, that there, there was something you know, wrong with me and they just wanted nothing to do with me. While virtually everybody that I confided in who was over the age of 40 was compassionate towards me. So it does seem to me that society, whether religious society, secular society, does seem to develop certain forms of, of empathy in people. It does seem to smooth off the rough edges so I think these Decoding the Guru guys, uh, Chris Kavanaugh and Matt Brown, are pretty accurate here in their critique. So, right? like, and I know that Jordan Peterson and others like to categorize these as simply impossible to develop without monotheistic you know, religious systems. But I question that. I question that you need to say, be nice to people because there is a God in heaven who will get you. Like Constantine invokes that he you know, uses the concept of God with his children. I have children older than Constantine. I didn't require to threaten them with God's existence in order to get them to do things like, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I don't want to, don't want to get into the old atheism versus religion debate, but like I had these conversations with a friend of mine, socially conservative Iranian guy, a colleague of mine, lovely guy. We had a lot in common, but we differed very strongly. And he was similar to these sort of cultural Christians in that he didn't have strong. Right. Sometimes exercise makes you better, healthier, finer, kinder. You sleep better. Your relationships go better. Sometimes it makes things worse. You become irritable, grumpy. You injure yourself. You become narrow-minded. You, uh, you neglect your relationships for as you go deeper and deeper into perhaps a disabling addiction to extreme levels of, of exercise. So too with religion. Religion can enhance your life. It, it, 
it can deform your life. Uh, setting goals. Setting goals sounds like a wonderful thing, all right? Self-help always talks about the, the power of setting goals, but setting goals narrows your focus. It tempts you to cheat to achieve your goals, and it makes you more, more likely to ignore the downsides, the price paid to achieve goals. So yeah, on the face of it, setting goals, good thing. I, I think for, for most people in America, practicing religion is a good thing. You get an in-group, you get community, you get a uh, sense of meaning in life, you get uh, ethical guides, you get uh, tradition, you have a way of uh, connecting with your family, extended family, the, the people that you grew up with in the same religion. So it, it's a powerful form of in-group connection and Many people have a yearning for the transcendent, and if they don't meet it in religion, they may meet it in some much more destructive way. On religious beliefs in Islam, but he felt very strongly that it was necessary for people to abide by the rules and so on that, that are proposed. And, and we, like, I had these arguments with him like 25 years ago. Which I felt like I was living proof. Like he, he liked me a lot, just like I liked him. He knew that I was a decent guy, like you, Chris. I've raised three children, and they're all done extraordinarily well, I have to say. And never once has any. So I didn't want to think this way because what, what gave my life meaning and purpose was listening to Dennis Prager starting in 1988 and then adopting Judaism as the, the best vehicle towards ethical monotheism, the belief that there is one God whose primary demand on humanity is that we treat each other ethically. And this was incredibly inspiring to me. But then I noticed as the years went by that plenty of secular people I knew were finer people than many of the religious people I knew. And I reluctantly came to conclude that the most important indicator for whether or not someone would be decent would be the quality of their connections with other people. So secular people who maintain good relations with their parents, with their extended family, who raise good kids, all right, they were pretty fair dinkum, good, honest people. On the other hand, uh, religious people who weren't able to maintain connections, weren't able to maintain relationships with friends, extended family, family, parents, siblings, uh, couldn't stay, stay married, uh, couldn't stay in jobs, all right? That kind of chaos was not cured by religion, all right? I think religion is great for religious issues and for, for building a community, for a, a meaning, type of meaning that you can put over the world. It's an excellent hero system that serves many people. It, just like psychotherapy is wonderful for many people, but for others, psychotherapy is either proved to be a waste of time or destructive. They've got into an unhealthy relationship with their therapist. I'm thinking about a guy I used to co-host a, a podcast with before they were podcasts, James DiGiorgio. And when he was going through a meaning crisis, he talked to his therapist about how he wanted to pursue stand-up comedy. And his therapist said, yeah, that's a great idea. So he devoted years to trying to develop a career in stand-up comedy, and it didn't work out. It was a waste of time. He would have been much better served putting his efforts elsewhere. So there's often self-help advice, follow your passion. Well, for a minority of people, that works out. For most people, following your passion and allowing that to override your commitment to a 40-hour-a-week job is not going to work out well. So yeah, a minority of people follow your passion for photography, for, for dance, for podcasting, for economics. That, that's a great choice. For most people, following a passion and allowing that to override your connections with friends, family, community, and making a good solid living, that's not going to work out so well. Any kind of religion or religious idea needed to impinge either on my brain or their little brains. So it's just, it's just clearly wrong. But my point is, is that it is. Right. Thinking again about therapy, uh, uh, people I know who felt like they wasted years in therapy, wasted a lot of money in therapy, that they you know, followed their passion and it wasn't, it wasn't a good use of their resources, <laughs> they would come to call uh, their therapist the rapist. Therapist really means the rapist. And sometimes that's true. But on the other hand, therapists are far more regulated than coaches, right? Everyone's a coach these days. You're a success coach. You're an exercise coach. You're a business coach. You're a lifestyle coach. Uh, coaches have almost no regulation. So in some instances, regulation is bad. It inhibits entrepreneurship. But in many instances, regulation is a good thing. It creates more accountability and higher standards. Rehabilitation centers, by and large, are very lightly regulated. As a result, a lot of people die when they go to rehab because probably most rehabs do not have sufficient 
uh, medical staff on hand. They are not sufficiently trained. You don't need to have much training to work in a rehab. You get very vulnerable people going there who are often prey to the predatory behavior of lightly trained staff. There aren't enough doctors on hand, people, you know, detoxing, uh, coming down from the side effects of alcohol and drugs, and the staff don't pay enough attention and people end up dying. And uh, re rehab centers are just rife with predators and with terrible, terrible behavior because, the, in part, because Obamacare legislated that every form of health insurance had to offer rehab for drug and alcohol addiction that would pay a minimum of $2,000 a week, I, I believe. And so this has led to a vast explosion in rehab centers, and many of them are not very good, and many of them, for many people, are likely to do more harm than good. It's, also, think about the business model for rehab centers, right? If, if they help you get well and you don't come back, that's not nearly as good a business model as if you only get some benefit, but then you relapse, so you have to keep coming back, right? The whole business model for rehab is that you come back because just a, a one-time one customer is not nearly as valuable or as important or as lucrative to them as someone who keeps coming back. 12-step programs, right? There's a downside to 12-step programs. You meet a lot of troubled people there. If you have poor boundaries, you can get into trouble. <clears throat> you can develop an unhealthy relationship with a sponsor. It is, a, it, it is something that like social conservatives like to hearken to, the need for like religiously inspired set of, of social rules and moral guidelines. And the, the truth, just the absolute truth is, no, you don't, you don't need them to be coming from some ancient scripture from outside. They come from inside. So, <clears throat> wow, my voice. So. With, with religion, with the uh, 12-step programs, with uh, yoga, with uh, various forms of wellness and self-help, all right, you can often fall into a destructive and toxic in-group identity, all right, which, which takes on the, the negative varieties of cults where you have one charismatic person at the top who leads you know, a high, high degree of intrusions into your life takes advantage of his uh, power over you. So yeah, in-group identity, usually a good thing, but frequently in 12-step programs, in recovery programs, in mindfulness, in wellness programs, in, in religion, right? Often people take advantage of their charismatic power over their followers. So it's not just priests who are diddling kids, right? Proportionally, I would expect, expect close to as many rabbis were sexually misbehaving with with children and teens as priests. By people, and every humanist knows this. Well, the other aspect of it, Matt, is that my particular field of research is in the cognitive science of religion. And there, there's a lot of focus on the evolutionary role of religion in establishing greater cooperative groups. So, you know, we've talked before about the concepts of morally concerned high gods and supernatural punishment and all these kind of things that may very well have played important roles in generating cooperative impulses outside of the king group. But what people like Peterson, and definitely Constantine because he doesn't know any of his topic except through secondhand exposure, is that in almost all cases, when you include controls that make reference to secular sources of authority, like courts or legal sources or whatever the case might be, so you, you, know, you have one condition where you're making appeals to religious authorities and gods and you know, supernatural punishment, and in another, you make reference to legal systems and moral systems and fairness and courts and that kind of thing, you almost always produce similar effects. Right, so like, and there are plenty of societies which are highly... Right, so people who become religious, they do tend to form a stronger in-group identity than secular people, and they do tend to treat people within their in-group better than uh, non-religious non people. So the, the evidence does not seem to show that religious people tend to treat out-group members any better than secular people. Now, there's a downside to tweeting and blogging and sending out newsletters and doing live streams, and that is it may distract you from more important work that you should do. So someone who I think hits a good balance is Nathan Kofnis at Cambridge University. But uh, there's a warning essay on Substack, Getting Too Good at the Wrong Thing, The Siren Song of Subscriptions. And the author, Nat Lyason, says, I worry that some of the best writers of our generation are stuck making tweets and newsletters, right? And that their work is ephemeral that very little of this writing matters. It might even be harmful to your long-term goals. So how many newsletters stand the test of time? How many tweets stand the test of time? Are there many Twitter threads that rise to the level of books? 
Well, I think if you connect with people, however you connect with people, whether it's through live streams, through tweeting, through writing newsletters, through writing blog posts or writing books or publishing scholarly articles, if you connect with people and the quality of the people you connect with, then you can have an effect. So some people will watch my live streams and they'll hear about good books and they'll go out and read good books. And I may play some role in in their lives that I would hope is positive. Uh, On the other hand, I can't say that I've only had a positive role on people's lives. Some people could not handle the, the controversial topics that we discussed on this show. They lost their, their mind, so to speak. They started making highly inappropriate comments that uh, rebounded to their detriment, lost jobs, lost uh, connections with family and friends. And uh, God forbid that my life has ever played a, a role in somebody's downward spiral, but that's probably happened. I, I've placed much greater emphasis over the last five years in trying to reduce the chances that uh, I'm doing harm with my live streams. But of course, someone could hear something and depending on who they are and where they're at, right, it could take them in some devastating direction. But uh, yeah, a lot of great tweets and newsletters are ephemeral. And uh, so sometimes you have to have to choose, do you want to place your emphasis on getting a large, shallow audience? Do Do you want to appeal to the great masses, or do you want to appeal to a tiny minority of highly intelligent people? If I were to find a profession for my, that is most common among my friends, probably be philosopher. If not philosopher, it'd be rabbi or attorney or professor. And these are elite people, right? These are highly intelligent, highly influential people. So have a small audience, but uh, an influential audience. Really secularized, which appeared to be getting by just fine, right? The Scandinavian countries and that. And like, people like Douglas Murray and Jordan Peterson would want to argue that that is all because of the history of Christianity, which is still there, even if the societies themselves are not now engaged in the religious rituals or don't have the people signing off, you know, in the actual belief. But that basically ends up being a non-falsifiable hypothesis. It doesn't matter how secularized your society is, how many people in your society affirm that they're non-religious. Ultimately, anything good they do is tied to the historical mm-hmm. contingency of religion. It's unfalsifiable. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to say it isn't, I, I'm actually open and fairly convinced by the idea about religion having social utility, especially historically. But they take that fact and then extrapolate so academics love the word contingency, and I love it too. It's, I think it's an incredibly important word. <laughs> and I thought, thought of it in terms of situation, uh, dependent on various variables. So in logic, contingency is a st- feature of a statement, making it neither necessary nor impossible. According to Google, contingency is a future event or circumstance which is possible but cannot be predicted with certainty. So contingency means that there are often various variables that affect what's going on in the world, as opposed to one overwhelming explanation. So the the word that I usually use instead of contingency is situation, that uh, depending on the situation, people will react differently. Okay, great question in the chat here from Elliot Blatt. Am I concerned that medical treatments to emotional problems encourage the papering over of problems rather than getting to their roots? Okay, this is beautiful. This is, this is perfect. This is why you're such a valuable member of this team, Elliot. So the roots for some questions are religious. The roots for other questions are psychological. The roots for other questions are physiological and biological and therefore need a physiological, biological, medical medication solution. So for for ADHD, from my level of understanding at this point, it seems for most people with full-on ADHD that they primarily benefit from the top line of medications, meaning the stimulants such as Adderall and Ritalin. Okay, but for, for other people, what they primarily need is therapy. For other people, they primarily need Alexander Technique. Uh, for other people, they may primarily need uh, friendship or uh, mindfulness practice. So depending what the problem is. So if you've primarily got a physiological, biological problem, there in all likelihood is primarily a physiological, biological, medical solution. If you primarily have a religious problem, in all likelihood, a religious solution would be best. If you have a, a problem where you're 
not getting enough exercise, then increasing the amount of exercise and doing it in a thoughtful way that's conducive to your best interests, that, that's what you most need. So this is a theme that I've started talking about a lot, I think, over the past few weeks, that people often look to religion for, for matters that are better addressed through 12-step programs or medication or psychology. Uh, sometimes people look in psychology or in medication or in drugs for solutions that are best addressed through religion. I have often sought in religion problems that I have had that were better addressed through psychology and through medication and through 12-step programs. So if you want to know about biology, I would think one would primarily want to consult with biologists. If you want to know about history, talk to historians. If you want to know about rabbinic law, talk to scholars of rabbinic law. If you want to know how to fit into an Orthodox Jewish community, uh, talking to an Orthodox rabbi would, would be helpful. So if you want to know about how to you know, make an honest living in business, all right, then talk to people who are accomplishing that. It to the only way that you can get people to be nice and considerate of others in the contemporary world is to constantly evoke religious symbolism and religious justification and read the Bible and so on. And it's just not true. It's not true. We ran that experiment in secular societies and yeah. we know that they do continue to function as religiosity becomes. Yeah, um, yeah like you, Chris, I, I definitely recognize the, the really important cultural role that religions have had historically across the world. And it goes hand in hand with, with other sort of forms of cultural development, which could be political, that could have social aspects and all kinds of norms and things like that. And, and religion is part of the mix. And I think it's, it's almost impossible to disentangle the stuff that might be coming from the, the bit of that culture that you label the religious bit versus the other bits. Because like these sense makers and free thinkers often say, it's different from actually the metaphysical belief, you know, like literally believing in a, in a God right? So when you take out those metaphysical beliefs and you just talk about the, the rest of religion, which is, it is like a formalization of the mores and mores of a civilization or a culture. And, you know, there can be mutual. Right. So th there are great benefits for Jews in hearing the perspectives of non-Jews on Jewish practices, Jewish culture, Jewish religion, Jewish military exercises in Gaza. And so too, there are great benefits for religious people hearing secular perspectives on religion. And I think there'd be benefit often for secular people hearing religious perspectives, uh, all right? We, we often benefit getting outside of our in-group or whatever's cozy and most comfortable for us and getting some different perspective. Well, influences back and forth, but I, it's kind of ridiculous to say that, I mean, in the current discourse, all it functions as is basically a, a reactionary talking point, which is let's get back to old-fashioned, traditional yeah. family values, right? These are the rules, and this is what makes you a good person, not like these godless, liberal atheist types who will do anything, who believe in nothing and, and actually are actually desperately searching for meaning. And as a result, they're going to become trans or something. Like that's the only role that, that, this, that this meme plays now. Yeah. And there's a, there's like a kind of fetishization of religiosity. I was raised Catholic. I went to mass every week for, you know, 18 years of my life. I don't mind. So whatever is important to you, you're going to want to proselytize it. So when I got into jogging at age 11, age 12, I finished five marathons at age 12, I would just constantly proselytize the benefits of running. Now, I probably did more harm, damage to myself than good through running marathons, but I was just absolutely obsessed with running until I couldn't run anymore because I developed Osgood Slaughter's disease in my knees. My knees would swell up from the pounding that I was taking during running, and I couldn't, couldn't run for the next four or five years. Uh, but... I, I saw the world through a lens of how awesome long distance running is until I couldn't engage in long distance running anymore. And then I looked for my next big answer to life and I found it in journalism. So people with ADHD were not equally suited to all uh, professions, right? Some, some professions we're going to do much better in. And so journalism is good for people with ADHD. Uh, the military is good for people with ADHD. It gives them structure. So I became fascinated with journalism in eighth grade and I saw journalism, that was going to be my path forward. And that was my primary focus for the next five, five years of my life. Then I started reading a lot of books on economics. And so I came to see economics as the prism through which I viewed the world. And I wanted to become an economist and I planned on getting a PhD in economics at Oxford University. Then I lost my health, you know, my life collapsed. And I started listening to Dennis Prager and I saw a Judaism as embodying ethical monotheism, that this was the, the magic key to unlocking how the world worked. Then I started writing a book on the sex industry, and that, that influenced how I viewed the world because I became a pariah, so I was on the outside of polite society, and so there are a lot more downsides than good sides to being on the 
outside of polite society, but there are some some advantages. You get to see things in in a new way, and so that that influenced uh, a more realistic perspective that I developed on life. So whatever you become obsessed with, right, and you'll see it in my live streams, you'll become very tempted to make this the the magic key for everyone else. Going to Mars is fine, you know, the, and I, I recognize that for plenty of people, you know, they get a lot of benefits from being religious and believing in God or gods, but. In the heterodox sphere, it is that religious hipsterism, right? Like the boring kind of just going to mass and, you know, not really caring that much about religion in your every moment, not discussing the theology and, and the importance for civilization of religion and whatnot. That's not interesting to them. And yet that is what religion normally, what religion is for most people, right? It is, it is a portion of their lives or a cultural component of their lives, but it is not this hyper-intellectualized, metaphorical, absorbing thing. Yeah. I mean, you could be overthinking it because on the other hand, counterpoint, mm. I don't think any of them really believe any of this shit, right? Like Huberman, for instance, right? Proclaiming that he's, you know, getting into God now and religion. Do you, do you think Do you think he's thinking about God while... No, I wouldn't. You I, know. I, I think in a way, yes, I would, with Huberman in particular, because I think that there is a certain proclivity amongst people who are theologically and you could say spiritually or alternative medicine inclined, that they have an esoteric perception of the world. So Huberman seeing that science points to some greater plan or some cosmic organization to the universe, that doesn't surprise me. John Pervaki being not religious, but constantly feeling the impulse of religiosity and, you know, the, the resonance of religious talking points and whatnot. It doesn't surprise me. I think that's genuine. On the other hand, recently, Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter, released a note on Instagram saying, hey guys, apologies for the lack of podcasts. They will be back. I've had the most mind-blowing few weeks and finally feel Jesus and need to reevaluate my priorities a bit. Talk soon, heart. And maybe, like her mom has, her mom has converted to Catholicism and is very now into that. So it, maybe that's all genuine, but a lot of that feels very superficial, audience-driven, or uh, Russell Brand's engagement. So I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. I think in some respects, there are people who are just religiously inclined people. And in other cases, there is the audience dynamics at play. Well, I'll And uh, Conspirituality. It's a left-wing podcast, but uh, frequently they do really important work. And it's good to, to get uh, contrary points of view. They talked, they also did a show recently on the guard pivot, Rogan, Brand, and Huberman. So let me see if I can cue that up. Today, Being healthier is happening. Agent, you may have heard along the way. What will you turn to? Who will help you? What will your ultimate piece of content be? From time out of mind, there's only ever been one answer, and that's God. I'll, I'll put the God filter on your voice for that part. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're looking at the growing trend of these top often contrarian podcasters who are expressing their newfound faith in a God. In this case, it happens to be the Christian God. Now we're going to play their confessional moments and discuss why at this point in their trajectory, they've decided to open up about their faith. And to be clear, this is not about denouncing anyone's faith because that's a personal decision and we don't want to take that away from anyone. But it is interesting that in the last few months, all three men that we're covering today have come forward as shepherds in ways that to us in our field of conspirituality research raises more questions than it answers. Well, today people, healthier is happening. Oh, come on. What the heck? Why? Ah, anyway, conspirituality, a terrific, useful term. It's also a terrific uh, podcast, but it's the, the combination of spirituality with conspiracies and the term, I think, was coined in 2011 in a paper by a couple of professors, Charlotte Ward and David Vose. So I played David Vose talking about the future of religion in the West, and they published in the Journal of Contemporary Religion, The Emergence of Conspirituality. So he talks about the female-dominated New Age with its positive focus on self and the male-dominated realm of conspiracy theory with its negative focus on global politics. They may seem antithetical, but there is a synthesis of the two that we call conspirituality. It's a hybrid system of belief. It's a rapidly growing web movement expressing an ideology fueled by political disillusionment and the popularity of alternative worldviews. How many people have we had on this stream chatting on this channel who have become disillusioned by politics and they will disengage and instead put their focus on business or on religion or go into conspiracy theories even more deeply and start invoking demons as an explanation for what's going on around them? That's, that's kind of a sign that you've give it up on uh, rationality and empiricism. 
So Conspirituality has international celebrities, best-selling books, radio and TV shows. It's a broad political and spiritual philosophy based on two core convictions. The first, traditional to conspiracy theory. The second, rooted in the New Age. So there is a secret group covertly controlling or trying to controlling the political and social order. And two, humanity is undergoing a paradigm shift in consciousness. So I find the second idea just ludicrous. And both ideas ludicrous. All right. I, I don't think that we're undergoing a paradigm shift in consciousness. So proponents of conspirituality believe the best strategy for dealing with the threat of a totalitarian new world order is to act in accordance with the awakened new paradigm worldview. So remember, during the early COVID restrictions, you'd get from these conspiritualists, these conspiracy theorists, that uh, this is the emergence of a new world order that was going to increasingly intrude onto our lives and become a totalitarian state. And that just hasn't happened, all right? As the COVID threat has diminished, all right, the restrictions have, have gone away. Growth of industry, growth of cities, growth of uh, capitalism, administrative structures has led to an increasing separation and specialization of various social institutions. We now occupy distinct roles in the family, in the workplace, in the community that no longer overlap. So this social and personal fragmentation has caused conventional religion frequently to become disconnected from everyday life. So alternative ideologies are available, offering holistic worldviews that contest the political pragmatism, economic rationalism, scientific empiricism, and the social dislocation that is characteristic of the modern age. So one type of holistic thought is New Age alternative spirituality, and they embrace the idea of a person as an integrated whole, mind, body, and spirit subject to a common set of principles, and the second ideology is conspiracy theory. So every conspiracy theory seems to have three principles. Nothing happens by accident, which New Age believers also hold by. Nothing is as it seems, and everything is connected. Right? These principles are as fundamental to New Age thought as they are to conspiracy worldviews. So according to this paper, conspirituality is a political spiritual philosophy based on two core convictions that a secret group covertly controls or tries to control the political and social order and that humanity is undergoing a paradigm shift in consciousness. So conspirituality is a means by which political cynicism is tempered with spiritual optimism. So it tries to curb the belligerence of conspiracy theories and self-absorbed and So guys, so, guys, are you ready to become? But, oh, man. Where's the, where's the right link? The, the God. Pivot. CVS Come Health on. in more ways than you've ever. Come on. Spirituality, independent media, your fa infinite co chaos. We're going to play their confessional moments and discuss why, at this point in their trajectory, they've decided to open up about their faith. And to be clear, this is not about denouncing anyone's faith, yeah, because that's that. a point. And in particular, the figure of Christ, are, it seems to me, inevitably becoming more, right, this is Russell Brand. more important as I become more familiar with suffering, purpose, self and not self reading the bible a lot more and as i've told you before i'm reading rick warren's purpose driven life when i grew up christianity seemed like it was either really irrelevant and old-fashioned and sort of dusty and sort of incense and sort of, oh, no, domine, or they tried to modernize it and it seems just like Right, okay, we're going to talk about Jesus. And like both of those routes seem like, well, I don't know if there's anything for me. And I suppose it takes a certain amount of adulthood and it might be different for all of us. For me, it seems that it's taken quite a lot to recognise that you need, I need a personal relationship with God. It occurred to me that if instead of always talking to myself inwardly, I could replace one of those voices with an indwelling God. It says in Galatians, it is our job to die so that as Christ died on the cross, he might be reborn in us. I'm very interested to hear what you think, because for me, my heart is open. Oh, well, what I think is the following. Um, <laughs> he, he alludes to suffering and repentance, but vaguely, and I wonder why. Uh, I, I'll, I'll get to those more general questions a little bit later, but the standout here uh, I don't know about you, but I've often just been absolutely overwhelmed by self-loathing. And one one solution that I've sought for self-loathing is to just lose myself in religion or in some kind of endeavor 
in some kind of mission to change the world, to save the world, right? So I get to shock off, you know, this unwanted self who I loathe and try to take on this new persona, you know, reborn through the power of God. Is name dropping Rick Warren. So Warren's 2002 Purpose Driven Life has sold 50 million copies worldwide in various languages. And I think it's the perfect evangelical text for brand because it's mostly boilerplate uh, Christian self-help, although Warren hates the term self-help. Uh, and that disguises some extremely reactionary views. But it sounds like this, quote, your value is not determined by your valuables. And God says the most valuable things in life are not things, exclamation point. Or without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope, unquote. So this is advice and encouragement that's that's so bland. Uh, Warren has had some real cross-cultural success, uh, such as getting tapped by Obama to speak at the 2009 inauguration. But beneath the kind of Ned Flanders hokum, he's he's out there fighting the gays and against reproductive rights. He's blaming atheists for all the world's troubles. And he's insisting that, like, Terry Schiavo be kept alive in a vegetative state when that was happening. So I think it's totally on brand for, for Russell to select the most laundering Christian texts and thinkers at this point. I also wonder, does Russell understand that replacing a voice in his head with what he thinks is God doesn't mean that it's necessarily God? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. that's, just, that's just giving his voice inside of his head another character. An elevated character. Yeah, exactly. And that's the danger. That's where the danger begins with a lot of religious thinking, right? Oh, that voice in my head was really a God telling me to do these things for so long. Okay. But Rick Warren. Okay. So out of curiosity, I visited his main campus when I lived in LA. This is back in 2015. I wanted to experience a sermon from a man who could sell that many books. Like if you're up there, like, what are you saying? And this campus is huge and beautiful. So I don't share the political, cultural, religious orientation of the host of Conspirituality. So I think it's, it's brave and speaks well of Rick Warren that he's willing to take on uh, same-sex marriage and other controversial issues. I'm sure I, I don't agree with Rick Warren on all of them, but uh, many of these mega pastors also do sacrifice and put themselves out there on hot-button controversial issues. So I understand why people on the left would regard it as against the gays, but for people who believe that uh, the ideal form of sexual expression is between a man and a woman within monogamous marriage, right? they have a different hero system. Trads, right, have a different hero system from modern seculars, liberals, and lefties. So I think that uh, to the extent that uh, Rick Warren and then who's that other pastor who's incredibly successful, uh, kind of a self helpy megachurch pastor in, in the South? Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but often, often these, these mega church pastors do put themselves on the line for causes that they believe in and that ally that ally with my traditional perspective on life, which is very different from the perspective of these three hosts of Conspirituality. It is really on prime real estate. But his sermon was, as you insinuated there, it was very bland. There were some pretty malicious items inside of it as well. And there Right. So Joel Osteen, Dennis Prager would uh, criticize him and other megachurch pastors saying they didn't speak up enough on contemporary political, social, cultural, moral issues like same-sex marriage. But uh, Joel Osteen has at times put himself out there to say unpopular things about social, cultural, religious, moral directions in this country. There's something that's always stayed with me from that night. So the theme of the evening was the shape that God crafts humans in. Right. And Warren started by talking about how bad assisted suicide is because God chooses when we're born and when we die. He shapes us throughout life. But it was also very jokey. He is charismatic. He is sort of the guy in the corner that you could just hang out with. I get that vibe from him, at least his public persona. And so I read uh, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life and his book Purpose Driven Tr uh, Church. And Rick Warren had insights in there that various that rabbis have used on me. And one of them was that uh, Rick Warren said, I think, in Purpose Driven Church that uh, you're not allowed to publicly criticize other members of your church outside of the, the church community, such as obviously on a blog or on social media. 
And so rabbis would use that and then people would, would join synagogues that I belong to so that they could become exempt from any criticism of them on my blog. So the rabbis would call me in and say, look, this is a person's just joined our community. You need to you know, remove all the negative things that you've written about them. And so often when people were upset by something I'd, I'd written on a blog, all right, they'd contact my rabbi to uh, try to pressure me to take it down. You want this personality is what he's saying, but you're really this for God. And that was throughout the entire thing. And it went all over the place. So there was a total of 43 minutes that I captured on audio. And he had a bunch of rotating guests. It was very professional people coming on and off. And they were all throwing jabs, some joking, some not, about the shape that God gave us. But then there was this moment. And the more we move away from the Bible, the more people have an identity crisis. The more we move away from the truth of God, the more people have an identity crisis. And what we've got today is people deny what God made them to be. We got light-skinned people wanting to be tan. And we got dark-skinned people wanting to be lighter. We got men wanting to be women and women wanting to be men. And people with fur, curly hair wanting to be straight hair. And people with straight hair wanting to be curly hair. And those of us with receding hair wishing we had more hair. And, and everybody's in an identity crisis. Why? Because we've gone away from the word of God. Okay, so he must be against the free market giving people choices about how they would like to be in the world, right? <laughs> well, he's worth $25 million, so I'm guessing he oh. spends that money somewhere. I also find it humorous that he... Look, you can generally be for the free market and against making it easy for people to transition their sex. Right, you can be generally for the free market, but against you know certain manifestations of the free market that may undercut the traditional bonds of morality and traditional ways that people have organized themselves, such as in you know monogamous heterosexual marriage. You can resist any encroachment on these these sacred values if that that's your hero system. So it's not weird that people may generally support the free market, but not one hundred percent support the free market. I think it's coincident. Whoops, wrong, wrong link. Okay, back to conspirituality. He starts this part of the litany with the idea that people wanting to be tan. It is Orange County, California. <laughs> this is the epicenter of plastic surgeries and bodily manipulations. It's throughout the crowd. So right. there's just this almost grab bag of ideas that... So Claire Corr suggests, how about a live stream with a, a Muslim guest? who suggests that uh, living by Muslim law would make people happier and better. Well, I'm absolutely sure there are a lot of people whose lives would be improved by Sharia law. For example, Steve Saylor makes this point that Islam developed, perhaps in part, its, its very strict sexual ethics in reaction to the wild amounts of promiscuity going on in sub-Saharan Africa. And so Islam reacted to the amount of promiscuity in sub-Saharan Africa Africa by developing a very strict sexual code. And I think most people's lives would be enhanced by following a, a strict sexual code. And many people's lives would be enhanced following Sharia law rather than being secular. On the other hand, a lot of people are made worse by following Sharia law. Cool. Is that like in the, in the current climate where increasingly more and more people are becoming less religious, both in the United States and in other places like Australia, where people are already extremely irreligious, that it just happens to be that an awful lot of contrarian, heterodox, free thinker, influencer types all seem to be migrating towards Christianity. I don't think it's a coincidence. Well, no, it's not a coincidence. But what you just described though, though, Matt, I mean, I don't think this is the explanation, but you just pointed out the general trend is away from religion and the heterodox contrarians then go towards <laughs> religion, true. right? Like, but I, I think it is more that the heterodox audience is religiously inclined and conservative that's, people are religiously yes, inclined. I think that's doing more than the contrarian impulse. And I know, I know that's what you're saying. That's what I was saying, which is that they portray themselves as contrarian heterodox free thinkers, but they, weirdly enough, they all seem to basically arrive at the same point, which is pretty standard, socially conservative, <laughs> reactionary. Yeah, like, you know, it all just fits. Yeah, we can all blame Jordan Peterson for that. So that was just something that I thought was worth noting that, you know, you will see crop up now and again from the guru sphere. You, you even saw noted atheist James Lindsay at one point talking about, you know, his cultural Christian sensibilities. So he since ended up like feuding 
with the evangelical religious people. So, you know, there's always these countervailing forces. You got to appeal to your new friends, but you're also... Yeah, people will go where they get love. That I'm particularly susceptible to cults because with my social dislocation, with my ADHD uh, getting in the way of proper inhibition so that I was constantly blurting out things or conducting myself in a way that made other people uncomfortable. I got the 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 label of just being a general weirdo, a Torah weirdo in the words of uh, one Asia Torah rabbi, Torah weirdo. I mean, that's that's pretty applicable. So the general weirdness that I displayed with untreated ADHD, it isolated me and it made me long for community. And one easy form of community for people who are otherwise isolated is uh, joining a cult. It exists in out throughout these 43 minutes, but notice and why I picked this clip. Again, this was November 2015. So this was well before transgender people becoming a right-wing culture war issue. And he's comparing gender identity with people who want curly hair and he's pontificating right. about refusing tanning beds. Uh, I can speak more about the carelessness this represents, but we might as well move on to uh, Joe Rogan's recent confession of faith. And we'll also touch on his recent interview with Chris Rufo. Yeah, before we do that, I just want to say one last thing about how strategic Brand's choice of war and might be. I mean, to his credit, Warren has taken an outspoken position against sexual abuse in the evangelical church by doing things like calling for accountability in the Southern Baptist Convention. He even personalizes it by talking about his wife as a survivor of church abuse. So I think Brand is aligning himself with not only a man of God, but with a whistleblower in that culture. So I, I don't think he could choose a better reference given given his particular situation. Yeah, and in fairness, they started the sermon that night with all talking about the sort of aid that they were sending to Africa. They actually have So when I was ill with chronic fatigue syndrome in my 20s, I was desperate to find meaning and purpose for, for my life that had been devastated by illness and reduced me to being in bed 18, 20 hours a day. And I was kind of lucky that I found someone generally moderate like like Dennis Prager. And uh, if if Rick Warren becomes your guru, you could do a lot worse than Rick Warren or Joel Olstein or, or Dennis Prager. So young men in particular often go through crises of meaning, which uh, leads them to seek out people online. Sometimes it's people like me. Uh, sometimes it's people like Andrew Tate or Joe Rogan or Andrew Huberman have all these classrooms on the campus where those things are happening. And you can debate whether or not missionary work is good and what kind of contingencies happen when they're sending aid. But at the same time, one of the aspects of the church that I always appreciate is when they are charitable. And he does seem to put some efforts uh, around that. But again, there are, are, of course, contingencies. A man without any contingencies, though. Let's move on to Joe Rogan. As time rolls on, people are going to understand the need to have some sort of divine structure to things, some sort of belief in the sanctity of love and of truth. And a lot of that comes from religion. A lot of people's moral compass and the guidelines that they've used to follow to live a just and righteous life has come from religion. And unfortunately, a lot of very intelligent people, they dismiss all of the positive aspects of religion because they think that the stories are mere superstitious fairy tales that, you know, they're, they have no place in this modern world. And, you know, we're inherently good and your ethics are based on your old moral compass and we all have one. And that's not necessarily true. We need to, we need Jesus. <laughs> I think for real. Like, if you came back now, it'd be great. Like, Jesus, if you're thinking about coming back right now, now's a good time. Yeah, pretty soon. Yeah. Now's a good time. I think that. So, balance theory has much to offer us here to understand what's going on, right? The more you have in common with other people, with your community, with your family, with your friends, all right, the more solid your relationship will, will be. The less you have in common, all right, the less balance there will be. So, th this applies to podcasters as well. Right, the more imbalanced you are with your audience, right, the, the better your relationship, the more lucrative your relationship, everything will just go easier, be more pleasant for you. So I frequently find myself combating almost everyone in the chat on various issues. I believe that, for example, that, uh, that our elites, our public health authorities, our 
governing politicians did a better than average job with regard to COVID, which alienated me from most of my audience. And that's not fun, right? It's not fun losing your audience, it, particularly when you've got rejection sensitive dysphoria. That, that phrase, that, that theory speaks to me, right? I, I feel like I've got an unusual sensitivity to rejection and it tends to send me into you know, a, a tailspin of, uh, of, of agony and, and defeat and hopelessness. And so life just is a lot easier when you're in balance with the people around you. So if your audience is dominantly Christian or pro-Christian, right, your life is going to be a lot easier if you adapt yourself to them. You see it with, with Dennis Prager, right? He came from an Orthodox Jewish background, but most of his audience has been Christian. And so as he's spent over 30 years as a talk radio host, he is increasingly moved closer and closer towards his Christian audience while maintaining his Jewish practice. But now he's even come to entertain the idea of a devil, which is not a normal topic, not a, a normal theology in Judaism, but uh, it's a dominant perspective in Christianity. And because Dennis Prager's audience is overwhelmingly Christian, right, he's taking on more and more of the Christian worldview, because that's simply a happier, more balanced, more lucrative place to be. This is the Jordan Peterson light argument, which is we need Jesus or Christianity because otherwise it's all chaos. But then look at who's speaking, like who fosters <laughs> chaos? I mean, I, I love how you can spend years rising. So Christianity is sometimes a force for cohesion. And sometimes, such as the 30-year war in Germany in the 17th century, all right, it just rips a country apart as a reaction to the 30-year war, all right? And uh, let's find out exactly wh when that took place, right? Between 1618 and 1648, due to the, the bloody, ferocious nature of that 30-year war between Protestants and Catholics fought primarily in Central Europe, largely in Germany, Right, estimated 4.5 to 8 million people died as a result of this war. Germany reported population declines of over 50% as a reaction to that devastating war. Politics in the West has tried to remove religion from, from politics. It's tried to uh, take, take it out of the, the topics that we argue over and say it's just a, a private matter of, of someone's individual faith. And so more and more of life in the political trajectory that we've been on it in the first world in, in the West over the past uh, 400 years is to make more and more of life neutral, remove it from the political. So we try, there's been a move to remove religion from the political, to remove immigration issues from the political. So for example, in Australia, the major parties had essentially a bipartisan consensus that they would not fight over immigration levels, that uh, immigration and multiculturalism would not be matters of dispute, would not be matters of, of politics. It would be neutralized. Immigration and multiculturalism was sacralized and neutralized and removed from the realm of the political. And so too in the United States, the, the major parties have by and large not fought over the issue of immigration. So we see this steady trend as a reaction to the damages of religious schisms and religious wars to try to remove religion from politics and try to remove more and more of life from politics to neutralize more and more of life, such as immigration levels, topics of civil rights, uh, multiculturalism, right? It's been steadily removed from the political. Into the top of global media by platforming conspiracy theories, and then you get high, and then you look out on all the wreckage and say, well, we're all going to need some kind of sensible structure for ourselves sometime soon. I mean, Joe, we have moral and ethical guidelines in media, and they're based on intellectual curiosity and humility and respect for evidence and a rejection of emotional manipulation. But Joe's not a media guy. He's just a guy talking into a microphone. You're, you know, oh, he doesn't right. have the legacy media outlet responsibilities, of course. I, right. Okay. <laughs> I'm so tired of this argument that humans can't possibly have a moral compass without a belief in a higher power. When he says that it's not necessarily true that humans can follow moral guidelines without religion, he's first of all, overlooking the fact that 
many religious people can't follow their own damn moral guidelines. <laughs> and he's also yeah. overlooking the centuries long exploration and implementation of secular philosophy and secular humanism in America. We're not the only culture to attempt that, but Rogan can't even manage the basics of American history. So I'm going to guess he's not well versed in global ideologies. You know, I want to say as a lapsed Catholic that the real juice of religious guidelines is in the perpetual temptation to break them. Uh, that's like an absorbing and pleasurable tension. If you can obsess about like whether you should masturbate or whether other people should be allowed to have anal sex, you're, you're pretty much absorbed in the project of what orderly is versus chaotic and you're projecting it outwards. And in that sense, I think Rogan might just be joining. So different people have different instincts. I believe that most of our political instincts are genetic. And so if your primary fear is lack of order and your primary fear is contagion, right, then you're more likely to be on the right. And if you're on the left, your primary fear is going to be ignorance, lack of education, and uh, discrimination. Peterson in looking for some kind of more elevated orthodoxy within which he can continue to play a contrarian role because they don't want to sign on to all of it. I can tell you that. Yeah. And contrarianism has existed for a long time. Again, their historical understanding is terrible. I mean, since Aristotle and probably since before that time, slavery was associated with religious hierarchy, a divine order that kept certain people in their place. And American history has shown us over and over again that the most regressive laws that we have are implemented from a religious perspective from this so slavery sounds absolutely horrible and uh, it was horrible for many people but we're all going to be slaves to someone all right if you have a job you're essentially a slave 40 hours a week now it's not the same level of slavery as african americans suffered in the united states prior to the civil war but if you're a good person you are a slave to certain standards right if you're a husband with a wife and kids to and and you're a normal husband right you're you're going to have some element of slavery to your spouse and to your children, right? When you form bonds with other people, when you become part of a community, you become obliged to other people. So we're all going to serve somebody or something. This idea that there is a natural order that we have to abide by. And we're living through it right now when it comes to bodily autonomy. That's a big thing in the Rogan space with their anti-COVID views. We've been living through that for centuries. But the notion that we need religion to be good people is usually stated. So in certain circumstances, right-wing hierarchical traditional solutions work best. And in other circumstances, new innovative solutions work better. So whether the, the right-wing approach to life or the left-wing approach to life or some version of either approach to life works best is in large part going to be determined by circumstances. Overall, with regard to COVID, the dominant liberal left paradigm, right, simply was much more effective, much closer to reality than the knee-jerk conservative distrust of uh, big government and distrust of science that cannot be easily understood. ...by people who don't trust themselves to not have metaphysical guardrails in place. Don't let your training wheels dictate the reality of those. Some people need metaphysical guardrails. Most people, however, will get all the moral guidance that they need from their relationships. If you're a normal person, meaning two-thirds of the population with a secure attachment style, you will get your primary cues regarding morality from your relationships. Right? If you bond and connect with people, get on the same page with people, develop a rhythm with other people, right, and get energy from your connections with other people, all right, out of all those connections will always come an ethical code, a psychological and moral bond. Right? The primary way that our behavior is shaped is not by metaphysical guardrails, but by our relationships. Right? The more important a relationship is to you, right, the more wedded you will be to the moral code that you share with those other persons who no longer need them, though. I think we have to say that we're recording this only a day after Rogan's two and a half hour session with Chris Rufo dropped. Like, and we've both had time to listen to it. We might do a review of that separately if we can stand it. But I, <laughs> I just need to say, like, I knew that the Rogan podcast was bad. I just didn't know how bad it was. And, and why is it so bad? Because they have a particular hero system that, that differs from a traditional one. 
Luke, what do you think of Anatoly Carlin's designation of the distant right and conservative right being low human capital and the woke Sam Bankman Freed types as high human capital? Generally, I think he's correct. Like bullshitting. Like that's where he finds God. There's this empty space between his lips and the mic, that improv space. And I think that's where the divine is for him. Well, and also his profession of faith. And espousing God, believing in God, it costs you nothing right now espousing a particular religion, right? That will cost you, right? But just believing in God, it makes no discernible difference to people's behavior. But if you hold yourself out as accountable to a particular moral code that comes with a particular religion, a particular denomination, right? A particular fidelity to sacred scripture, right? Then you're going to become a hypocrite because you believe in standards outside yourself. Someone who doesn't believe in Scripture, someone who doesn't believe in moral standards outside of himself is never going to be a hypocrite. So people who are religious, people who are traditional are going to be much more likely to be called a hypocrite because they believe in standards outside of themselves. But just believing in God, that does not limit your behavior, right? That does not encumber you. That does not enslave you, right? That does not oppress you, like uh, taking on the requirements of a particular religion. So in in Judaism, we talk about the, the burden, essentially, of, of taking on the traditional Jewish way of life, of taking on God's commandments. There's a notion that we are effectively a slave or a servant of God. Seems to be the sort of, you can just say it and it'll happen without understanding that all religions have those guidelines in place because you have to have the discipline to follow them. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about that in a bit later. But as I've admitted before, I was a regular Rogan listener a decade ago. Even before the pandemic, though, I dropped off. There was always stuff that I tuned out. It's important to like recognize where you agree, where you disagree, and then decide whether or not you're going to stay on board. Rogan just kept getting worse in the conspiracy space. And I haven't listened to an entire episode in years. So this Rufo episode might be the first in a while, goes on to compare Marxism to rabies. I mean, and that's all in the first 10 minutes. I'm only 18 minutes in and it hasn't... Talking about the Chris Rufo episode on Joe Rogan. Gotten any better now. Yeah, I want to pick up on that example. I mean, there's so many, every sentence would have to be fact-checked. Like nothing could be published anywhere from this podcast on any other platform. <laughs> but But when he rants about the terminology change from homeless to unhoused... He's talking about it being some useless woke gesture, but he doesn't have any curiosity about what that's about. He's not curious about, you know, the fact that, I mean, his lack of curiosity actually is part of the problem. Unhoused comes from unhoused and anti-poverty advocates saying that people living in tents are making homes like all humans do, where they create whatever dignity they can. They have communities. The problem is they don't have housing. And if we spotlight housing instead of implying that they are from nowhere, they're just wandering hobos and not part of our society, then we can focus on the communal or state responsibility for providing housing. <laughs> well, I'm going to guess that there is not a lot of unhoused people on Lake Travis in Austin outside of his fucking compound. So he probably doesn't have to interact with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, there's. So I, I find these woke terms, like I'd say unhoused instead of homeless. All right. My traditional nature just rebels against th these, these word games. But if you can calm down your immediate instincts and, and actually listen to what the other side of the political aisle is arguing, then you start to see, oh, th that there's, I, I can understand where they're coming from, that there is some validity. I don't necessarily agree, but I can better understand. I, I recognize the benefits of this approach. So many more things in my head right now about this episode, but let's hold off. We'll see if we yeah, let's follow it. up on that. I feel like we're going to have the story of us, right? And, and the story of everything. And so, but yeah, I pray out loud in the morning. Um, All right, this is Andrew Huberman. Um, sometimes again in the middle of the night if I wake up. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's only recently that I've been doing this more often. It's given you yeah. peace? Or... Oh, my goodness. It's given me so much. It's given me peace. And, you know, it, it, this is going to sound weird, and probably people are going to be like, what are you talking about? If this, it, 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 it works. Mm -hmm. It works. There's a, there's a way in which certain things I was grappling with, you know, 
um, I just couldn't resolve. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. And it was all internal and I just couldn't do it. What, what, how were you trying to resolve these things? Like have an answer? Yeah. Discipline myself. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was super, uh, you know, undisciplined. I mean, obviously I have a lot of self-discipline, but yeah. you know, I, like I, I always pray, you know, I want to remove my defects of character. I want to, um, you know, I, I certainly pray for other people. Um, I, I mostly, you know, these days I pray for the ability to really harness as much care and love for other people and for myself, something I haven't been that good at mm -hmm. in my lifetime, um, in order to be able to put the best possible work into the world. Lib Headley notes that uh, the Tove family jewels has become junk. Right, great, great uh, linguistic development. To really serve. Like, I really see myself as serving higher power. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a conduit. So I think this is a higher-end confession. So Andrew Huberman sees himself as serving a higher power. Wow. Like, Rogan is Chick-fil-A, and, you know, this is more like Whole Foods. Um, I listened to the whole 13-minute homily, that we clipped this from. And in it, he also has some Buddhist contemplation going on in the renunciation vein. So in Andrew Huberman's confession of faith there, there are no requirements then made on your behavior. So this is why religious people often have suspicion of spirituality. Both religion and spirituality have strengths and weaknesses. But uh, Andrew Huberman can talk eloquently about God and higher power and dedicating himself to that service and carry on you know, sex simultaneous sexual affairs. There's nothing in his invocation of faith that restricts his sexual choices, that restricts him from doing anything that he wants to do, as opposed to if you belong to an Orthodox Jewish community, right? There are all sorts of things that you cannot engage in publicly and maintain your position in your community. Um, he's been going through a period in which a number of people close to him died, one by suicide. And this lends a, a carpe diem quality to the sermon. And he alone, within this trio we're looking at today, Derek, uh, connects this surrender to empathy. And I think that that might reflect where he started with his confession at the beginning of the clip with uh, a hymn of praise to the mysterious complexity of the brain, the body electric. And just to note, this comes from a recent episode with Cameron Haynes, but I always wonder why a scientist would study the Bible if they're interested in the story of us. I mean, you will gain an understanding of the story of Western culture, for sure. That's totally fine. But Huberman seems to be hinting at something grander and older than that. And if you want to know that story, you study evolutionary biology, you study anthropology, you study physics. He's a neuroscientist. You can study the very mechanism that invents stories in the first place, which will give you amazing insights into who we actually are. So in the world of uh, traditional Orthodox Judaism that I, I'm part of, people will say the opposite. Like, is there not enough in the Talmud to keep you busy? Like, why would you want to study these Goetia, non-Jewish uh, academic exercises? Like, why, why not devote all your time and attention to studying God's word? That's much more profound than studying man's word. So an obnoxious, you know, New Atheist prick. So you've, you've got to, you know, which which one would decide? It depends. It, it, for each guru, it will be dependent. But the Theo Rubin pathway from liberal New Atheist inclined Sam Harris fan to the Jordan Peterson, actually, religion is very important. And maybe I was too hasty as my audience becomes more conservative, is a, a very well trodden path. That's what we're saying. Indeed, indeed. Mm. Well, All right. last thing, Matt, for today, last thing is that. Brett Weinstein, Jordan Peterson, <laughs> did another podcast. <laughs> uh, uh, it was, well, one thing, it was actually pretty boring. A large component of it is just Jordan setting up Brett to talk about his visit to the southern border in the United States and the various migrant people that he encountered and what, you know, the nefarious or non-nefarious agenda is that is allowing so many of them to enter the US. So we've already heard Brett talk about this. And actually, he tampers down a bit the evolutionary conspiracy theory that he's developed about the Chinese lineage, right? It is there, but it is not endorsed or described as directly as it was in some of his other content. And actually, Jordan is fully aboard with it, 
but he seems to give it, he's good at giving it a more intellectualized patina, right? Rather than the conspiratorial edge. So there's, there's a big portion of it, which is that. But the thing that struck me mostly about the conversation is that Jordan and Brett are two of the guru sphere figures who I think have mastered the art of speaking in pseudo academic ease, right? Mm -hmm. They, they make everything that they want to talk about sound more intellectualized and erudite than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And together, they are, you know, even to me, somebody that's been involved with academia for decades now, it sounds very intellectual. At, at the, the way that it hits the air is, oh, these are very smart people discussing, you know, intellectual theories that they've developed. And then you just have to pause a second and realize, oh, no, they're not. Like, just pay attention to what they're saying. And it's absolute, they're normal conspiratorial bilge. But it doesn't strike like that in mm -hmm. terms of delivery. That's well, the thing which they're so good at. All right. Well, show us an example of what you speak. Okay. So this clip is them talking about the biological concept of Reciprocal altruism, something you'll be familiar with, Matt, right? It comes up in game theory as well, but <laughs> listen to this. Now, there's a transformation in viewpoint, which you associated most particularly with the founding of the United States, that's, that transformed that idea into something like a more general appreciation for the possibilities of radical altruistic reciprocity, regardless of kin relation. I wouldn't, say, so, I wouldn't say altruistic. The, the thing that drives it evolutionarily... Altruistic? Reciprocally altruistic means okay. that we are at advantage by collaborating. We both come yeah, ahead. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not, sorry. That, that's perfectly, perfectly reasonable re, uh, restatement. So the notion is, is that there's tremendous comparative advantage to be gained as a consequence of collaboration independent of kinship. And that's partly because you can draw on a more diverse range of talents and abilities. And developing that argument might buttress suggestions that a more diverse multicultural population would be useful because of diversity of opinion, if you buy that sort of thing. Um, but, but then... And, and then, so I would, I would take issue with two of your propositions. One is that the core of that is somehow American. And also, although I think the Americans elaborated that very well, but also that I don't see how to distinguish that from the proposition that mere economic success will guarantee something approximating peace, independent of any other overarching framework. You hear what I'm talking about, Matt? It is so in much of Orthodox Judaism, where there is not much uh, knowledge of non-Jewish ways of thinking, uh, Jordan Peterson passes for some deep philosopher. Uh, Brett Weinstein often passes as some deep philosopher because in th those parts of Orthodox Judaism where there isn't much secular learning and where people are generally losing it at the game of life because they struggle to pay the bills and uh, they feel very oppressed by, by life, right? They, they latch on to people like Jordan and Brett. Doesn't that sound like two intellectual giants, you know, hashing out the important discrepancies in their mm -hmm. theory? And, you know, oh, sorry. Yes, I, I meant reciprocal altruism. Of course, that restatement was important, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I do hear what you mean. These guys are masters of the art. And, you know, it's good you brought a secret because you've taken us back to what Guru's Pot is all about. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've wandered around a little bit, but, but this is fundamentally what it's about. Like, if you take the little segments of that, like, then each alone could well be part of a, you know, a broader dialogue that, that was careful and scientific and intellectually rich and so on. But if you, if you step back and look at the, the whole thing, it doesn't make any sense. Like they started. So there are very few things where you can just immediately dismiss someone as being worthy of paying attention to. But this, this word salad, this attempt at profundity using academic jargon, but just really spouting nonsense is just an immediate giveaway that uh, these are not people who are worthy of respect or attention, right? We live in the attention economy, Brett Weinstein, John Peterson, not worthy of it. Off talking about reciprocal altruism as, as if it was this, you know, amazing new thing and, and not from like 1970s. And as, as if it's like a mysterious puzzle for those two to sit down and solve why reciprocal altruism may well occur. And, and then Jordan goes, right, okay. So how does this relate to... What and another clue that uh, someone's probably worthy of being dismissed for taking them intellectually seriously is if they engage in overstatement. So overstatement is a dramatic way to capture people's attention and to compete in the attention economy. But if you're willing to compete in the attention economy by frequently engaging in overstatement, uh, I don't think you're worth paying attention to because you're essentially selling your soul to try to get your piece of the attention economy. So you can steal in many ways. You are stealing from people's use of their time if you engage in the, the word salad, the nonsense, and the dramatic overstatement that uh, typify Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein and other people of their ilk, including often Sam Harris, uh, Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager. Can you talk about the economy and uh, like 
the what, finding what? multiculturalism and the finding of the United States, but this is related to, you know, actually you do know this theory, Matt. <laughs> it's the lineage theory that Brett has that Western societies are based on non-kinship derived lineage. That they, they don't focus on lineage systems, but the, the societies which people are immigrating from, they're more lineage and kin based. So it's these two fundamental incompatible systems that are being forced together. And if we're not careful, the West will fall back into the kinship see, lineage I systems see. of the past. So, yeah, so that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? They, like, they're, they're using terms. Yeah, Brett and Jordan, they just frequently talk about things they don't know anything about. Just like many guests on my show, they would give very strong opinions on books and articles that they'd never read. Right? When you encounter this kind of poser, right, not worth giving them your attention. Like, you know, evolutionarily evolved cooperation about recipro reciprocal altruism. And these are extremely substantial ideas with a whole line of research behind them. And they're very well understood. And then they use those to then the, just throw in like what is just, just crazy, totally unsubstantiated speculation, whether it's Brett's stupid lineage theories or Jordan Peterson relating it to multiculturalism and economic development or something. But if, you're, if you don't know, like if you're not familiar yeah. with, the, with the material, then you might well think that this is all just a, a sensible continuation of, of, of the concepts they introduced. Um, and, yeah. and, their style, and their style, which is the reason you played it, I know, is that they go through all the forms. Like let's, let's be careful. Let's, let's define what we're talking about here. Yeah. Okay, minor correction, whatever. And the, the language and the tone, everything is a signifier of you know, proper, careful, intellectual dialogue. So yeah, I mean, just be careful out there because it's like, if, if Chris can listen to it and go, wow, that sounds, that sounds good, then man, they're, they're good at this. They're good at the style, I should I emphasize that. That's the thing, it sounds like, you know, if you're doing something else, it kind of, it sounds like an academic lecture and, and it's designed to do that. But like, you know, we talked about in the recent episode we did about Jordan, about, you know, this stupid study that he had to try and determine whether the Nazis were right wing. And like, conceptually already, it's a stupid question because we know the answer to that. But Jordan talked about it, you know, as if it's a very complex question. And we don't know, and nobody's done this study that, you know, the, the study that we talked about with, you know, him giving like anonymized policy positions and trying to determine with the left and yeah. right wing. But listen to this map. This is, again, a, a different topic, but you're going to hear him, you know, talking about LLMs and the new... And if people exaggerate their their contributions, exaggerate their credentials, exaggerate their importance, right? Another giveaway that uh, they're probably not worthy of your attention. ...who study that he's had and like relating it to his big ideas. So just listen. So let me give you an example of this. One of my employees, a former student, has mapped out the semantic network of the concept of God. Now, the way he did that was to find the smallest possible set of words that can be substituted in discourse for the idea of God. It's a substitutability issue. Okay, so imagine this, that there are 10 words or concepts that are most likely to exist in the same cloud of conceptual space as the idea of God. You could dispense with that central idea and just use that concatenation of 10 subsidiary ideas as a replacement. Then you can imagine each of those ideas has a cloud of associated ideas around it. Right. And this is literally encoded in semantic space. It's a statistical relationship. So young people tend to be absurdly confident of themselves. I mean, Kyle Rowland made many terrific contributions to the show. But as one would expect from someone in his early or mid 20s, right, there was also an amount of overconfidence in that he would frequently opine and give uh, cutting critiques about uh, books and topics that he just didn't know much about. So I remember how absurdly self-confident I was and, and my peers were in our late teens, early 20s. So early teens, right, there was a lot of uh, anxiety that I remember and lack of confidence. But then I started feeling increasingly competent by my junior year. In my senior year of high school, I was the editor of my high school newspaper. And I, I had various teachers who told me, oh, you could do anything. And I believed them. Now, you could imagine that there's a semantic web around the conceptualizations of kin-based ethical systems. And there's a, and a center as well. My brother before anyone else. That might be the concept at the center, something like that, right? But that could be mapped. And you could imagine that this other cloud of concepts that is associated with abstract reciprocal altruism and its formulation also has a center. What that should mean, if you did the same mapping for, for cultures, is that you should be able to place cultures on a continuum from kin-based orientation to this more abstract formulation that frees up economic resources, right? And then... The hypothesis you would derive from that is that the most difficult problems of integration would arise as a consequence of trying to integrate the most kin-based systems. And you could further hypothesize that it might even be worse than that. It, it might be that the most difficult people to integrate would be the psychopaths who take advantage for themselves of the ethos of the kin-based system, right? Because we always have the psychopath problem, right? And, and people don't like that problem, but like it's a world-destroying problem. So, okay, so what do you think of that idea, so generally um, speaking? What do you think of that, Matt? <laughs> I'll tell you what I think of it. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god chris it takes oh them god. so long to say a point as well right like i can say that in two sentences societies which are more kin based will use kin based language and terminology and societies which are less kin based more developed will use a different set so if you use some linguistic mapping you might be able to detect societies which are Okay, why do I think that my ADHD was not diagnosed by, by teachers, by people around me, by all sorts of mental health professionals? I, I've been seeing doctors since 1988 fairly regularly. Uh, it, it, I did not present with, with the typical ADHD symptoms that were dominant in the DSM at that time. So I wasn't so much physically disruptive and I didn't lack a sense of time. I would turn in my assignments on time. I was known for, for finishing and, and having a good sense of time. But the emotional chaos, th that was the biggest downside to my ADHD. The, the lack of inhibition, of normal levels of inhibition, apparently 85% of what the brain does is inhibit. And so my lack of inhibition, my lack of normal levels of executive function in the front, prefrontal cortex, my, my inability to sustain attention as opposed to just uh, temporarily I'd get obsessed with things and then I'd move on. So it get, got misdiagnosed as uh, narcissism and uh, say tendencies towards bipolar disorder, uh, possibly depression and anxiety. And it, it all stemmed, as I understand it right now, as I stand here from undiagnosed ADHD. So Unfortunately, the DSM does not take into account the devastating emotional consequences of ADHD. And so it, it uh, tends to get diagnosed with, with people who are much more physically disruptive than I was. But uh, my, my you know, inability to have a normal level of executive function and inhibition and so conduct myself without you know, overwhelming amounts of general weirdness uh, it led to my social isolation which then led to depression, anxiety, uh, acting out to get attention. And uh, so I would be misdiagnosed, as I mentioned, with, with narcissism. So I, I hope that uh, mental health professionals going forward will take more into account the, the emotional symptoms of ADHD. And it's also much harder to get diagnosed as an adult. So I certainly manifested ADHD as a kid, but it wasn't in the typical physically disruptive arena. Sure, more or less on that spectrum. Yeah, I get it. That's right. And that, Matt, you'd be surprised to know people have done things like that. People mm. have mapped out things like the degree of collectivism in society, the degree of mm. different types of pronoun use, right? The, the way that people talk, whether they're talking about themselves embedded in social networks or mm -hmm. as individual atomic people, yeah. right? No, I, and I can well imagine how that exercise could be done, right? You can do these textual analyses. You can map things to a latent semantic space these days. It's all very clever, but it is still just a, it's a textual analysis and you might go through a whole bunch of texts and you might find some, I'm sure you would, like you find all kinds of differences between, between all kinds of times and societies and places. But then, so John takes a long time to say that. This is the idea that I'll do the study. But yeah. it started off with taking the idea of God, Right. So you yeah, take yourself, it's like, and, 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 and then he ended up talking about psychopaths. I mean, like it is, I, I think another. It's example. a very Jordan Peterson kind of thing, right? He, like you say, he's just jumping around between his analogical yeah. reasoning. Yeah. It sounds like he's laying out a scientific, you know, like a, a, like a program study. of research, a study, a program of research. But he's not. Yes, he is referencing some technical. Yeah, this is what bogus uh, gurus often engage in: is analogies. They're really good with the analogies, and analogies sometimes can be useful. But uh, other times they can leave you with less understanding and less clarity. Well, it's basically textual analysis approaches, some methodologies. He's referencing some stuff. It's all very technical. It all, it all sounds very complicated and abstract and, and mathematical. He gives the impression, like stylistically, he's very much like a, like a mathematician who's trying to explain yeah, the concept of so say, a, a, you know, a latent vector space. You know, it's, it's hard for you to wrap your head around, but I'll, I'll help you, you know, with some analogies and so on. And, and legitimate mass people do talk like that. And it can be hard to follow, but they're actually talking about something meaningful and real. <laughs> that you can, that, you think about, that Jordan isn't concatenation, concatenation, I don't even know the word, of 10 subsidiary ideas. Like in that style of speaking, it is, it is intentionally dense and academic and lofty, right? That's the mm -hmm. point. It's supposed to highlight how intelligent Jordan is. And just to highlight, Matt, just to rift on this, to show why it would fall apart under basic scrutiny. So Jordan was just often, and in this conversation as well, talking about religion and religious concepts, right? In religions, do they make references to family and kinship bonds and brothers and sisters in Christ and so on? So Jordan... At the one hand, it's talking about how Western societies are these kind of bastions of individualized and non-kinship-based systems. But he's just evoking religion, which very often deals in kin-based language and references, right? And saying that that's a threat 
to society. But at the same time, he wants to say that religion is the mm -hmm. fundamental core that makes Western society. Like it's all all sounds good, but there's so many contradictions in what he wants to argue. Yep. And yeah. it, I, I read a terrific book by Stephen Turner a couple of years ago, Liberal Democracy 3.0, Civil Society in an Age of Experts. So it says Liberal Democracy 3.0 represents the slow transformation from a politics of sovereign citizens to a politics of diffused experts, right? That's what we have now, by and large, ruled by experts in which much of life is neutralized for, and removed from the political sphere. So electoral struggle being gradually supplanted by expert bodies commissions, right? The, the, the voting franchise has been limited to less and less of life. So democracy and liberalism are considerably contradictory, right? Liberalism means that we're born with inalienable rights. Democracy on its most base meaning is that uh, the majority rules. So if we were trying to explain the significance of the 20th century in political terms, right, we think about the development of science and technology and that more and more of our life has been ruled by experts in science and technology, right? We began the 20th century in an age of empires, but now we're increasingly governed by experts who have a level of expertise that regular people just can't even comprehend. So what's the connection between these two developments, the rise of science and the rise of expertise? What were the consequences for science and liberalism, right? So you don't see much discussion of science and expertise in political theory. The greatest single work of liberal political philosophy of the late 20th century, John Rawls's A Theory of Justice, 1971, is utterly devoid of any mention of science. The most influential critics of Rawls, such as Robert Nozick, find it possible to write passionately and seriously about contemporary politics as though science contained absolutely nothing of relevance to political life. It doesn't hang together. No, but if you make it dense and technical and abstract enough, then you don't notice the inconsistencies and the facts that none of it hangs together. You described this, Chris, as like this recording, this interview between these two was just like a, they were idea jacking off one another. They were, they were yeah, just they were. It. They were. It was high level idea jacking. <laughs> so that's correct. And I'll play one last clip, which, which illustrates the idea jacking in action. And you can actually hear, you know, the kind of like intellectual frenzy. If you listen to the whole thing, there, there's parts where it's, you know, more relaxed. But once they get into bumping into each other's theories, <laughs> oh, it's amazing. And they're presenting this, they're plugging the holes, you know, they're coming at things from different points of view. Brett has the advanced biological and evolutionary knowledge. And Jordan has the more psychological, religiously deep understanding of these issues. And, you know, when you put them together, Matt, they're painting the same picture, but just from different angles. And that's played out in its full manifestation in the gospel stories. And the, the, the culmination of this, and I can't see how it could be any other way, frankly, is that the most appropriate form of sacrifice that guarantees the best possible outcome, all things considered, is the full and radical voluntary sacrifice of the self in relationship to the highest possible good. And I think that's what's encoded in the Christian narrative. So my, my friends from my Seventh-day Adventist upbringing in, in Australia invoke Jordan Peterson. I mean, they, they love Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson, his practice of religion is you know, quite different from any normal, regular understanding of religion. For him, it's an intellectual exercise and an opportunity for him to deliver sermons. That's what it looks like to me. It's a limit story, right, of, of sorts, because it, it investigates the nooks and crannies of all the dimensions of potential self-sacrifice in, in service of the highest and integrates them. And so anyways, that's partly what this new book is about. But that's where my thought has gone further with regard to the point that you made about what happened in Vancouver. I knew then what you just said, which was that I answered that because I knew that that was the biologically appropriate answer. Right. That's where the rubber hits the road, man. That's yeah, that's what that's what this whole experiment is. And all of the architecture, all of the language we have and the structures, the belief structures that we carry and the stories that we transmit them with, that architecture is about something that we can't see and didn't even have a hint existed until a couple hundred years ago. So um, that's a that's a tough pill to swallow. And as you point out, most people <laughs> yeah, don't have the background to see. Yeah. But um, I would also point out, though, that if you compare the difference between what you said, I behave as if I do, it wouldn't matter if you spoke as if you did, as long as you behaved as if you did. And it wouldn't matter somebody who speaks as if they believe it, but doesn't behave that way is the inverse. The point is, this is all about modifying behavior. They're, they're riffing there, by the way, on Jordan Peterson answering Sand's question, if he believes in God by saying, I behave as if I do. Right. right. So he didn't answer the question. But, but Brett said that was, you know, Sam didn't get it, but that was stunning and important. And that broke mm. the whole, uh, but Sam couldn't grasp it in his naive new atheism. So, yeah. yeah. Sacrificing your totality of yourself in the service of the highest good and like, like, 
Yeah, that, I mean, look, that, what, what can you say about that? It's psychobabble, pseudo-scientific bullshit. Theological. Yeah, like much of Andrew Huberman's work, it's just uh, pseudoscience. He, just like Jordan Peterson there and Brett Weinstein used, used the language of academia, all right, but uh, to engage in babble, that's very similar to what Andrew Huberman does on his number one ranked uh, health and fitness podcast. People are in abomination and then sleeping with gay prostitutes, right? So I'm okay, wait. And, you know, so for me, this further information about his personal life. Okay, here's uh, Decoding the Gurus on Andrew Huberman. A well-founded hit piece, but, you know, just like with, say, Donald. All right, let me get it off. And personal relationships. That's right. It's, it's just salacious gossip. He's doing nothing more than putting that expensive testosterone replacement therapy to good use. What's the point of being an alpha if you don't get what you want? <laughs> yeah, some people, I believe some of his fans did mention the charming phrase, Chad ramming. <laughs> he's, oh. just, he's just Chad ramming or whatever the case might be. He's a millionaire, is... Matt. He's a super influential man. He's very handsome and rugged and virile. And so what? He chooses to, you know, lead on six women. What are we? Moralizing church Nancys? We're, this is 2024. I'm a person, an individual can do what they want, right? People can do what they want. Yeah, look, I mean, look, there is obviously an aspect to it, which is... Uh, yeah, personal hit piece in a way, you know what I mean? It may be a well-founded hit piece, but, you know, just like with, say, Donald Trump, you know, and the various personal revelations that occurred there. Uh, at one level, it is about him personally. It isn't about his policies or or whatever, but people still consider it relevant. So, yeah, look, I mean, for me, I guess um, I, I do take, like, I'm, I'm not such a high decoupler that I'm going to take anything that is, like, the, the various bits of information you have about somebody's background, about the kind of people they associate with, the way they conduct themselves in their personal lives. I mean, a, a lot of this stuff can be relevant when you're forming an opinion. Right, everything you do affects you. And how you conduct your, your sex life does say s something about you because a normal person will develop very strong bonds if he starts doing intimate things. You start developing intimate feelings, doing intimate things. So who a politician is sleeping with, for example, or who any important person is sleeping with, right, that is going to affect their priorities. So whether it's your, your mayor, your senator, your president, Right, who they're sleeping with is going to have a profound effect on their priorities. About someone, and way before these revelations, I mean, this doesn't really change our evaluation of him no. very much at all because we identified a whole bunch of issues that we've got with his approach to his podcasting career science and, communication, and science yeah. communication and the way he evaluates literature and his somewhat disturbing connections to the Wu Health and, you know, maximizer alpha male manosphere type thing, which yeah. he kind of, yeah, he has like a dual personality in his public broadcast, which is presenting himself as, you know, a very normal, a very respectable researcher and not just a manosphere bro pushing Wu Health and supplements. And, you know, so for me, this further information about his personal life, while you have to treat it with, you know, you don't necessarily assume that everything that is written is 100% true yeah it does fit with the less charitable interpretation that you and i had about uh, his activities yeah so to me there is validity to the criticism that one the piece is overwritten it's extremely long i would say ten thousand words or more and uh, and it gives a lot of detail as a result you know it's at times feels like what is the point of this four paragraphs you've spent on a particular issue and i think there's legitimate points to be raised there but one aspect that I would want to emphasize is that it isn't just a matter of he said, she said. For a magazine like this to publish this kind of piece, they would have done fact checking. And the story that they are recounting involves people receiving messages, receiving videos, and so on. And they indicate in the piece that they have confirmed via these sources. And the fact that they have you know, multiple sources giving the same account from different perspectives means it isn't just he said, she said. So anything that's in that piece will have been checked to make sure it's not actionable, right? That they have reason to support it. And similarly, that's why they provide the responses from Huberman's spokesperson consistently, like denying things and then saying where the evidence contradicts what has been said there. So it isn't just the case of he said, she said. Yes, it doesn't mean that you should take every account that's provided, um, every quotation by the women as the God's honest truth and the exact objective presentation of you know what happened. But it is also not the case that everything is just equally as likely. So I think this is a good middle path, all right? One doesn't necessarily take everything that the women said as, as God's truth, but it does reflect on Andrew Huberman, how he operates. Right. No, it definitely seems that there was a misrepresentation of exclusivity with these women. Right. Now, that's one thing. But the other is that people are mistaking this as, so if somebody has six girlfriends, we shouldn't be able to heed their health advice. And no, that's not the point. The point is somebody who presents themselves in a certain way and then has a personal life which suggests a completely different character than is presented to the public. That is what is usually considered hypocritical, right? You know, like the preacher saying gay people are an abomination and then sleeping with gay prostitutes, right? It's the, the delta between their public persona and what they are actually engaged in. That's, I think, 
part of the thing that people are missing. So Huberman's presentation of himself as a very down the earth, humble science guy who, who is producing content about resisting giving in to temptation, about treating people with respect, about how to form meaningful relationships. And then you get a piece which is essentially detailing a litany of abusive, manipulative relationships. And also as part of that, using optimizer and therapeutic language to justify your behavior, it speaks to a worrying disconnect between your public and private personas. I think the analogy with the religious preacher, he's got a, a dodgy personal life, that sort of holds with him a bit, doesn't it? I mean, he's followed the line of a, a lot of our heterodox type influences in proclaiming belief in God and sort of finding religion. That, that happened yeah. a few months ago, I think. Yeah, and he has talked about, you know, the importance of honesty in relationships and all these kind of things. In fact, Matt, there's a clip that's been doing the round where he was talking to David Buss, the evolutionary psychologist who talks about male and female relationship patterns and these kind of things. And, and listen to this segment. You can't have long-term affairs with six different partners. Yeah, unless he's um, juggling multiple uh, phone accounts or something. Right, like right, right. And some men try to do that, but um, I think it's a, it could be very taxing. <laughs> so that is a meme that's people, you know, yeah. uh, inserted Kirby enthusiasm music at the end. But that was them talking about, you know, men who would do this kind of thing about having different phone accounts and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And Huberman's response to this was also interesting because uh, he tweeted out, if you go and look at this account, he's just tweeted out some promotional stuff from the episode. He hasn't said anything about it, except the episode that he released was one with a magician talking about, you know, the psychology of magic and whatnot. And let's just listen to a segment of the clip that he used to promote the episode. It's like falling out of love. <laughs> Something like, yeah, that's really. I mean, a, a previous guest on the podcast, Carl Dice Roth, one of the best bioengineers, neuroscientists, and psychiatrists in the world, um, went on Lex Friedman podcast, and they were talking about love. And Carl said something interesting that's very relevant here. He said, um, he's a colleague of mine at Stanford, very poetic guy. Um, he said, you know, love between two people, romantic love, that is, is one of the few things in life that we collaborate with someone to story something into the future. Hmm. You, you know, this is different than the love of a child or a sibling or a parent or a pet, et cetera, or a friend. Right? You're creating a story that's based on real experience of past and present, yeah. but there's this storying forward of love. That's great. And um, and falling out of love involves, of course, the ending of the story moving forward, but also, a, in some cases, sadly, a revision of the events of the past. Yeah, so I wonder if there was any subtext to the choice of clips that he used there. Yeah, yeah. So he released that after this article came to light. He hasn't responded to the article directly, but he released that. No, he just released a, a clip indicating that when relationships end, people have a tendency to feel disappointed and revise their assessment of the relationship. So Yeah, maybe revise the facts and yeah, get... Yeah, yeah. Wrongly. So, you know, that is a response I would take. It, but the point there as well, Matt, if you assume that this was not planned as a response is Huberman is often talking very sincerely about relationships and love and connection and human bonding and these kind of things with his audience, right? So mm -hmm. I feel that this is why some people would regard the revelations as being contradictory to that image that he cultivates. And actually, although you can find immediately the heterodox fear, the kind of Lex Friedman extolling, you know, how much Andrew Huberman is a good man, Scott Adams retweeting things about the media attacking him or whatever, his subreddit actually does have a lot of people saying, well, this is just causing me to have a very different opinion of mm -hmm. Andrew. And it's fair to say there's also a clear gender divide in the responses where women ha have recognized the issue that, you know, his behavior indicates more readily. Whereas yeah. with men, there does tend to be more, well, boys will be boys. You know, he's a millionaire alpha. What did you expect? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th the way that the usual suspects and the podcasters stand just join shoulder to shoulder on things like this every time something like this comes up. Like Lex Fridman's response there was totally predictable from him. And this is someone, Lex, you know, he's all about just, just pure love. And, love, and, honesty. And all, all of those things, schmaltzy, saccharine bullshit, frankly. And of course, his response to this was, it's heartbreaking to see a hit piece written about my friend, Andrew Huberman. I know him very well and can definitively say that he is a great human being, scientist and educator. Hit piece attacks like this are simply trash, clickbait journalism. Desperately, I can't read the rest because he's blocked me. So Clinging on uh, to relevance, Andrew should be celebrated, period. His podcast has helped millions of people, including me, lead healthier lives. Keep going, brother. And that yeah. response is very so, illustrative. But, but one thing to say, though, Matt, I'll just mention quickly is like, so what, Lex? And so what, all these bros that are talking about Huberman's benefit? That doesn't actually undo any of the things that are detailed in that piece. You can get benefit, but it isn't all about you and your workout routine, but, right? That's like but, not the point of the article. But in terms of Lex, it totally illustrates what you've said before, which is that his like hyper empathy and hyper love is extremely selective. And in this yeah. case, it's very selective in terms of being targeted at his... Yeah, so the reality is for everyone, love is going to be highly selective. Compassion, by, by definition, is highly selective. All right, that, that's why we're, we're built to be tribal. And so you see very tribal reactions to this Andrew Huberman expose, right, where his supporters in distant sphere, you know, come to 
um, to say he's a great guy. And then other people have always been suspicious of Andrew Huberman say, ah, this confirms everything I thought. So yeah, we're, we're built to be tribal and tribal generally is an effective way of going through life. But living in the 21st century, all right, there are often opportunities and benefits to transcending one's tribal ties and trying to see things from a disengaged, disembodied, uh, 10,000 foot level. And I think that's what I try to bring to this show. I, I recognize my tribal ties, but I try to see things from a 10,000 foot level. And I think uh, Decoding the Gurus similarly tries to see things from the big picture level. Mate, bro, and collab- bro, Herman. And he'd be the same with Joe Rogan or any of these other people, but certainly would not extend it to, to, to other parties. I think just trash hit piece journalism, nothing to see here. Yeah. yeah. And the other response that you see quite a lot is people beginning their take by saying, I haven't read the piece on Huberman, but, <laughs> right? And it's it just, it's very common that people don't read the piece. They focus on their interpersonal relationship with Huberman. I find him, they always be nice. You know, we, he's always been very kind and important to me. And then, like you say, relating it to where they see him as sitting in the culture war. So if they're a heterodox, you know, like podcasting bro, then absolutely fine. What's the issue? And vice versa as well. I feel like people have very, very uh, flexible standards. Another thing you said to me is that if it was like Ibrahim X. Kendi, about which these personal feelings had come to light, which didn't reflect well on him, they would not forego the opportunity to put the boot no. in, right? Some consistent people might, but generally speaking, no. And it- Okay, let's uh, talk about Candace Owens falling out with Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire. Get some commentary here from Glenn Green. But here's the real meat of the matter when Ben Shapiro tries to explain what line it is that Candace Owens crossed. And so when it comes to the host on The Daily Wire, obviously everyone is able to say what they want. Nobody ever comes to me and says, you can't say X. Nobody ever says that to Walsh. No one ever said that to Candace. But the reality is that there is an Overton window at The Daily Wire. Obviously, there was a non-meeting of the minds. That's pretty much all I can say on this. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of this has happened publicly. Uh, and the, but you know, to the extent that, that The Daily Wire is, in fact, not a publisher, is a pl- that, that is, in fact, not a platform, it is a publisher, that means that there is no moral obligation for The Daily And there's no free speech problem with The Daily Wire saying we don't wish to pay a particular host for that host saying I don't wish to work here anymore because, again, there's a parting of the ways that, I'm, that you know, it's not really open for discussion at this point. Does, does it surprise you? That so- okay, so oh, let's hear this question. So many people, even on our side of this, are confused about that as it relates to... So the little that I know about this, uh, I would probably sympathize with uh, Candace Owens probably about 60% of the time. But she said a large number of deranged things because she lives on the edge. She is a contrarian. That's how she's become so popular. Uh, but she still says so many deranged things that uh, she's not someone I take seriously. And uh, Ben Shapiro... Again, not someone I take seriously. He just panders to his audience. To free speech and quote unquote cancel culture, like severing a business tie, as long as you're not throwing someone in jail and they're able to be everywhere else, is not. Uh, I'm not super surprised that the controversy. Yeah. Okay, these people, honestly, if I'm being totally honest, they make me sick. They cannot think in any form of principle whatsoever. One of the biggest media controversies in the last five years was that the New York Times had published an op ed by Tom Cotton during the Black Lives Matter movement in which Tom Cotton advocated that the U.S. military should be deployed onto the streets of the United States to crush the Black Lives Matter movement on the grounds that that movement had become systemically violent. And many, many journalists inside the New York Times said that is outside of our Overton window, as Ben Shapiro put it. Overton window, Ben Shapiro is really not using that phrase correctly. The Overton window really is a theory that says you want to create as broad of a range of political views as possible. You want to widen the Overton window if you're a radical so that views that have been deemed way far outside of the mainstream, get closer and closer to the mainstream. Ben Spear, when he says over to window, is saying there's a range of views that I may not agree with, but these are the acceptable views within our media outlet. And you can't cross the line here, and you can't cross the line here because then you're outside of the Overton window. And he's saying we as a media outlet have every right to set the boundaries of what we consider to be acceptable views. And if you go outside of those boundaries, we have the right to fire you, and free speech is not implicated by that. Okay, so if that's the, if that's the case, why was there so much uproar when the New York Times decided to fire two of its editors for publishing Tom Cotton's op-ed that called for the deployment of American military to quell the Black Lives Matter movement? The New York Times editors were simply saying what Ben uh, Shapiro was saying. We have an Overton window, and that op-ed was outside of our Overton window. We don't want to be associated with views that call for the U.S. military to crush a social justice movement against racism. That was their perspective, and we don't want to be associated with that view. We're not saying these editors should be put in prison. We're not saying Tom Cotton should be put in prison for that view. We just don't want to host this view. We don't want to subsidize editors who would publish this sort of thing. I don't know a single person on the right who defended the New York Times there. Just like I don't know a single person on the right who defended NBC News from getting rid of Ronnie McDaniel. It was presented as a kind of crisis in free discourse that within major media outlets, you cannot express certain political views that are within the mainstream without getting fired. 
And yet here's Ben Shapiro trying to justify why Candace Owens is gone from The Daily Wire, not because of a business reason. Outside of Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens is the biggest name at The Daily Wire. She has the biggest audience. They're probably comparable in terms of the number of people who watch their show, who listen to their podcast. Maybe Ben Shapiro's bigger. But Candace Owens is in that same category. There's nobody else at The Daily Wire who competes with Candace Owens. I guess Justin Peterson if you want, but it's, the point I'm making is that Candace Owens is a huge uh, draw. That's not, it's not for that business reason. But what is true is that The Daily Wire was started with investment from a right-wing billionaire, millions of dollars, a pro-Israel billionaire, and Ben Shapiro is essentially saying that we have limits on what you can say about Israel, and Candace Owens went outside of them. Now, if you're comfortable with that and you think that's fine to fire journalists because they express political views outside of some line, then how can you criticize NBC News for doing the same with Ronald McDaniel or The New York Times for doing the same when deciding they don't want any Trump supporters there? Now, let's listen to the rest of Ben Shapiro's answer to this next question, because this, too, is extremely illuminating. Honestly, because to, to a certain extent, I think that there's been a, a reaction on the right to the excesses of the left. So because what the left did is they said that the Overton window ought to be closed so tight that no one can get inside the Overton window. Basically, if you're to the right of Hillary Clinton, you can't be allowed inside well, the Overton window. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and not just with regard to platforms, but with regard to publishers. So, for example, this week, NBC News deciding that Ronna McDaniel was too much for them. Ronna right. McDaniel can't work at NBC News. The sacred halls of NBC News must not be sullied by the former head of the RNC. Jen Psaki, however, can have a show on MSNBC, despite being press secretary for the White House five seconds ago. Right? The, the, the right's response to that is, I think correct to say you guys have shut the Overton window too tight but I think some elements of the right have basically said there is no Overton window the Overton window should be completely exploded with regard not just to platforms with which I kind of agree but with regard to publishers so all right so I mean do you, do you see what he's saying he's saying we're all drawing Overton windows meaning and again he's misusing this term but what he really means is we all have limits on uh, lines that you cannot cross on certain issues and the reason I'm angry about what NBC News did even though it's exactly the same as what the Daily Wire did is just because their line is wrong and mine is right except you can go to the you can go to NBC News. They have a lot of Israel supporters at NBC News, and you can support Israel there, but then you can also criticize Israel. They have a lot of Israel critics at NBC News, or at least at MSNBC as well, and they have debates about this topic. Apparently, you can't have that debate, though, at The Daily Wire, because you're about to hear Ben Shapiro describe what the line is that Candace Owen crossed specifically when it came to Israel. NBC News not only has an obligation to hire Rana McDaniel, NBC News has the obligation to hire Alex Jones, for example. Right, which, I, I which just makes true. no sense at a business level beyond, beyond free speech. I mean, there's a reason that networks exist. It, it right, they have editorial, they have editorial positions. No. Daily Wire has a very strong editorial position on a wide variety of, of issues. And by the way, I should say that you know, there are a lot of people who are suggesting this is about disagreements over Israel. I mean, I can safely say it's not about disagreements over Israel to the extent that without reference to Candace at all here, Matt Walsh has taken the position that America ought not be involved in the Middle East at all. Matt Walsh's position, so far as I understand it, and I've talked to him about it, is that Israel, in a conflict between Israel and Hamas, Israel is obviously a more moral party than the genocidal terrorist group Hamas, but also it's very far away he doesn't care and doesn't involve America. That's just a pure isolationist position. I disagree with it. I think it's wrong. I think that, that it's short-sighted. But again, he's on our platform. That, that is well within the range of acceptable discourse at the Daily Wire. So, Okay, so that's the line at the Daily Wire. You're allowed to take Matt Walsh's position. Matt Walsh is safe, I guess, for now. He's allowed to work at the Daily Wire, even though he doesn't support the United States financing Israel's military and Israel's wars. On the ground said, it's not our business. You're allowed to say that. Why? Because, explained Ben Shapiro, at the end of the day, Ben, Matt Walsh does affirm the moral superiority of Israel. He, he, he says, look, I don't want the U.S. financing Israel, but of course Israel is morally superior to its enemies. And as long as you say that, as long as you pay that kind of homage to Israel, then you're on the right side of the line. You're permitted to say, I don't think the U.S. should finance Israel, but notice too that Matt Walsh, though I guess he has said this before, he barely ever talks about it. Okay, good, good, uh, solid critique there from... He's been allowed to, and again, I was told when I asked that a swastika was not necessarily anti-Semitic or disruptive of public worship. That doesn't seem right to me. Okay, so I think the symbol in, in of itself... It is. Oh, God, film. Please film. Please, for the love of God, film. It is anti-Semitic. So, is this not allowed? Oh, sorry. I didn't say it wasn't. Can I just ask the question? I'm just asking the question, right? I didn't say it wasn't allowed. Can I... So, if someone is carrying a sign that's a swastika, you said you wouldn't arrest them on the spot. It has to be investigated in line? I don't think it's... Yes, I think it's... In what? A swastika in and of itself is not anti-Semitic. There is nothing more anti-Semitic than... You were the public order acting legislation that we were funded by. Right. This this guy is just doing his job. He has to follow the law. And so he has to interpret things like a swastika within its context. Right. Everything we do happens within a particular context. And the context frequently determines what is moral or what is legal. Right. So, yes, the situation determines the ethic. The situation will determine the moral. So, yes, you can argue that... Uh, Ethics are both situational and absolute. If you believe in a transcendent moral system, all right, the principles and practices and scriptures underlying that transcendent moral system still have to be applied 
to changing circumstances. I can have the conversation with you. I can have the conversation with you. I'm happy to, but I'm just confused as to what's confusing about us. There are are various um, facets to the public order back, okay? Yes. So what, in this uh, sphere, we're working under things called Section 5 of the Public Order Act, Section 4A of the Public Order Act. They're, they're some, some of the primary legislation we're using, all right? So if you go away and have a look at that, and it's all about uh, if it's something's likely to cause harassment, alarm, or distress, if it is written, or there's written words, or there's um, spoken words that are abusive. So, sorry, if we, under what? Okay. So obviously the, the context determines the meaning of the swastika along with a lot of other things. All right, let's get some John Mearsham. Back in it. They're back in it in a big way. And they've created this mess with their monstrous policy in Gaza Talking about that Israel does not Gaza. have an easy solution. And they apparently, they meaning the Israelis, have not put forth any solution for dealing with this problem moving forward. Which raises the question, where are we headed here? Right. And I see nothing but trouble ahead for the Israelis and for the Americans and certainly for the Palestinians who are caught in this maelstrom maelstrom indeed uh and, and the last question i have for you today is, is do you have any sense because we've been for understandable reasons talking about the gaza strip and all that goes along with that but there are also about three million palestinians in the west bank and there's been lots of issues uh there that have been kind of falling under the radar uh do you have any sense of how things are evolving and developing there and how that might play into whatever happens in the gaza strip well i think terrible things are happening in the west bank but the things that are happening there are nowhere near as terrible as what's happening in gaza but it's quite clear that the settlers are on the march they're taking territory away from the palestinians in the west bank uh, and in many cases, they're doing absolutely terrible things to the Palestinians. Uh, I think it's clear that the Israelis would like to ethnically cleanse Gaza and ethnically cleanse the West Bank. And if they have an opportunity to do that in either case, they will do it. I think they tried, uh, but they so far have failed in Gaza. Uh, they've not really had much of an opportunity to cleanse the West Bank, but that may opportunity that opportunity may present itself down the road. But this is a disastrous situation, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. And I am sad to say I see no hope in either case. Well, yeah, and I think that as long as Netanyahu's in power, as long as the, the current administration in the U.S. Uh, remains where they are, I mean, I don't know why any either one of them would do anything different than they have from the outset of this. And that's just anguishing to consider for the the, the most powerless and the helpless of the people uh, in the Gaza Strip of the Palestinian people. And my heart just bleeds for them in that case. But, but I, I would just say, Danny, I don't think it matters whether you have Netanyahu, Benny Gantz, or anyone else in Israel uh, driving that train. Uh, they are committed to creating a greater Israel, and they are created. They are committed uh, to. Right. So what matters is the situation and the situation in Israel is that uh, Israelis by and large support what Israel is doing in Gaza. The personality of Bibi Netanyahu is not that important when compared to the situation. Pushing the Palestinians out. Uh, so Net, you know, a lot of people in the United States like to argue that Netanyahu is the problem. You saw this with Senator Schumer's yeah. uh, famous speech. You know, let's get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu, then we can fix all these problems. I don't believe that for one second. This problem is much bigger than Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah, he actually went on Fox News, uh, I want to say a week from a week ago Monday, uh, and was making this case before them. He said, y'all think that it's, it's me? He says, no, this is what our people believe. They're, they're all for it. And they're with me. And I think in that regard, he was probably right. Yeah. And by the way, I'd say the same thing is true in the United States. If you had Hillary Clinton in the White House instead of Joe Biden, it wouldn't make any difference. And if you had Donald Trump in the White House instead of Joe Biden, it wouldn't make any difference either. And the principal reason is the Israel lobby. The Israel lobby means that any United States president, whether he or she is a Democrat or a Republic, Democrat or a Republican, has remarkably little maneuver room and hardly well, any ability. I would to argue that they, they could show some leadership and say, you can keep your money if you want to. I'm going to do what makes sense here. That yeah. So whether it's Bibi Netanyahu or Ben Gantz, all right, it's not going to... It's not going to really make that much of a difference uh, with regard to uh, Israel's policy in Gaza. So his conspirituality saying, yes, uh, Huberman's behavior does Easter's matter. Full specific theories in a bonus episode. To put it against the freedom means using the New Yorker with New York Magazine prove <laughs> that a lot of people don't have media literacy skills. Yeah. But there is so much to unpack in this story. And it was a months long investigation that I did play a small role in. Carrie reached out to me due to my videos debunking some of Huberman's health claims and wanted to get my take on bro science, especially in the optimization space. And we talked for an hour about a range of topics in conspirituality around this topic. That resulted in one paragraph in the story on his affiliation with the green powder supplement AG1, who sponsors Huberman's show and where he serves as a scientific advisor. But that was included, I believe, to really paint the picture of an opportunist, which in my estimation is what Andrew Huberman is, or at least has become. 
most of the reporting focused on his juggling and gaslighting of six women, five who were interviewed for the article, including one Huberman was trying to have a baby with and who he lived with at the time. The article also questions what his Stanford lab really is, if it even actually still exists. And that has actually been discussed for some time. I mean, the man lives in Los Angeles, where he often lifts weights with RFK Jr. at Gold's Gym. Let's go. (laughs) A former student of mine emailed me a few weeks ago saying he regularly sees them together there. But bigger point. A six-hour drive from L.A. up to Stanford to work in a lab is highly unlikely. Yeah, and you've done this great job in tracking Huberman's slide towards popular and lucrative pseudoscience for a while now. So why don't you start by walking us through that? Yeah, so last July, Julian and I recorded an episode called The Andrew Huberman Paradox. Okay, Colin and Liddell. I focused on three How's it going, pieces. Man? Easter's in full bloom at Oops. Colin. Yeah, hi Luke. Uh, you know, happy, ha- happy Easter. And uh, what's uh, what's going on with Neocrat? Um, it's not coming up for me when I try to Google it. Uh, I guess uh, you know we're, um, we're we're producing so much kind of edgy and radical content that uh, Google have decided to uh, try to deplatform us as much as possible. So uh, the algorithms uh, working against us. Do you have the site backed up so you can put it elsewhere? Um, yeah, I, I generally keep most of uh, my worthwhile content uh, backed up in some form or, or other, you know. But uh, um, yeah, the site's the site's actually you know it's it's there. You just go to neocrat.blogspot.com and uh, you should see all our um, splendiferous <laughs> content. Yeah, it's not coming up for me, but maybe that's just temporary. Uh, so, so boom, boomer tech issues, Luke. So you get on top of it. Okay. Uh, what what uh, what world events have been capturing your attention recently? Uh, well, what have you been talking about tonight? Uh, I've been talking about side effects in the sense that uh, we we usually just think of side effects with regard to medication, but there are side effects to everything we do. If you engage in religion, there are side effects to religion. There are side effects to mindfulness practices. There are side effects. Harmful side effects. Yes. I mean, there's nothing, almost nothing that you can do that doesn't come with a downside. Uh, How about uh, moderate exercise? Does that have any uh, harmful side effects? If you mean something like walking, generally speaking, very little uh, downside, or but like 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 healthy eating. Does that have any serious downside? Well, it de- depends to. I mean, to what I, de- I think if you do if you do stupid things, uh, a stupid thing. Why would somebody do a stupid thing? Uh, somebody would do a stupid thing because it has an upside, but uh, because it's a stupid thing, it also has a downside. So stupid things have downsides, and intelligent things tend to have very few downsides. So I think it's uh, it depends on what you do and and how stupid it is. I think that's basically how you have to, um, you know, look at it. Right. Essentially, for most people walking, there, there are no downsides, and using good judgment with eating, there are no downsides. But, for example, I was raised a vegetarian. Uh, one, to me, the evidence is overwhelming that this is a terribly unhealthy uh, diet, and two, it's tremendously socially isolating. It makes you very unpopular with other people because they have to accommodate that, that weirdness. Do you have any history with vegetarians? Oh, no, I'm not, I don't come from a uh, much of a vegetarian background. Um, quite the rever- quite the reverse, in fact, being from uh, you know Scotland, the west of Scotland, one of the unhealthiest uh, diets in the world, apparently. But uh, you know, I've I've sort of uh, changed my eating habits over the years. Like um, living in East Asia, that also has some impact and. So I think uh, you um, you kind of figure out what's good for you and what's what's good for your health, and you you if you're intelligent enough, you should be going in that direction. And uh, obviously, vegetarianism is a kind of um, uh, I guess in some ways it's a sort of substitute religion. It's one of those kind of fads that came into um, being as people started to uh, to lose faith in actual religions. 
yeah, it, it becomes an identity, uh, just like, you know, gay is an identity for some people and then vegetarian is an identity for, for others. And yeah, yeah you... it's tribal. It gets to be a little yeah. bit tribal, a bit uh, cultish, a bit like left wing or right wing or alt right or dis right or whatever. Yeah. So, what uh, political topics are being being uh, the forefront in Japan these days? Uh, well, Japanese politics is is, is not really um, something that's, that's that's worth talking about. I tend to think it just sort of takes along. Um, but this uh, this year in general is quite an important uh, year for uh, you know elections and democracy and uh, Britain, America, all around the world. They're, they seem to be having elections, and uh, recently in in uh, Russia we even had a, a the facsimile of an election. So I find them um, I find this kind of constant need um, for rulers. Uh, to get some sort of popular mandate, quite interesting. You even see it in places like China and North Korea. You know, uh, North Korea is is basically an Oriental kingdom, uh, but they still can't just call themselves an Oriental kingdom. They have to, you know, pretend they're, they're sort of the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea. So it's kind of, sort of odd in that respect. Yeah, people want the legitimacy of being democratically elected. Uh, even if the the process that they engage in is far from it. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like uh, for me, uh, democracy has always been problematic because uh, basically it means giving a lot of weight to the opinions of stupid people, generally speaking. You know, and so this is the sort of um, audience that politicians have to kind of um, submit themselves to and pander to. So in the West, we're seeing a gradual removal of much of life from the political. So it started with removing religion from the political. In American politics, uh, immigration has been largely removed from the political until basically Donald Trump. But before that, the, the two major parties in the United States and the two major parties in Australia had essentially a tacit agreement that they wouldn't fight over immigration. Uh, I, I'm wondering, is, is much of Japanese life kind of removed and neutralized from the political? Yeah, I would say uh, pretty much so. Uh, things tend to be, well, in Japan, and there's much more of a consensus about things. And so then it becomes much more of a kind of uh, technical issue. And in Japan, Japan is essentially kind of like most places, most countries, actually. I mean, I, uh, People think that a country like Britain is a, is pretty much an open borders country because they had like you know, sort of like one million people coming in in the last year and so on. Uh, but most countries are actually quite anti-immigration, and I would say Britain's an, a, a strongly anti-immigration country. Um, and the the reason that it doesn't appear to be so is for all sorts of um, you know technical reasons, and. Uh, in the case of Japan, the Japanese are against um, they're against immigration like anywhere else, but uh, they have such a you know low fertility rate and uh, labor shortage, and they're um, reshoring a lot of their businesses, and so they need to uh, find a labor supply, and so they're they're finding all sorts of ways to bring people in, and so Japan's a much more kind of pro-immigration country than than people perhaps realize, but uh, the the people, the um, the democratic masses, they 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 remain like like uh, has in any country opposed to immigration. Now, Japan has been steadily building up their armed forces. They're supposedly moving towards spending two percent of their GDP on their defense force. Uh, the the rise of China must must be concerning to leaders of Japan. What do you notice about? Japan's movement towards taking more assertive role with their own defense? Um, well, yeah, uh, this is this is something that's been going on for the last few years because um, the, uh, the real reason I think the Japanese are uh, increasing their military spending is because they no longer regard the United States as reliable. And this is mainly on account of uh, the sort of uh, surprising uh, emergence of Donald Trump as a uh, you know presidential as, as, a, as an actual president and as a you know current presidential candidate. So they're 
you know, they're thinking, like, even if Trump wasn't around, uh, there is a strong isolationist um, tendency in America that uh, a clever politician can tap into. And, uh, you know, um, there is a kind of logical basis for American isolationism. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea for the rest of the world. I don't think it's a particularly good idea for America. But from an American point of view, it might sometimes seem like a good idea. Why should America be involved in all these um, power struggles in the Middle East and uh, sort of making sure the Europeans have got it together and so on? There's no uh, obvious direct reason for that. You could find uh, more compelling indirect reasons why America should be involved in the global uh, order. But uh, the Japanese have sort of uh, they've sort of come to the conclusion that America is um, not quite as reliable as it used to be, and so they that's probably probably the the real reason um, behind Japan's uh, uptick in military spending. And of course, uh, it wouldn't take much for the Japanese to to go nuclear, and uh, they would probably be able to you know put up quite an effective. Uh, a nuclear um, umbrella of their own if, if uh, things came to that point. So I think that's what we're, we're seeing. We're seeing that um, a lot of countries around the world are having to kind of step up a bit more because America is, um, basically America has been hacked by the Russians and uh, they managed to um, effectively destroy one of the uh, the two main political parties. They've, 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 they've turned it into this kind of uh, weird isolationist uh, QAnon kind of um, a conspiracy theorist party. But if, if Russia had absolutely nothing to do with American politics, wouldn't the Republican Party in America be essentially the same as it is now? I mean, how do you really think it'd be different? Well, I think the Republican Party used to be much more of a kind of um, proactive global international order sort of party. They wanted to, um, you know, um, uh, sort of defend allies and stand by their allies and uh, make sure that, um, you know, in the old days, the Soviet Union didn't uh, overstep the mark and so on. So I think um, the, Re the Republican Party was a little bit um, stronger on containing the so-called axis of evil uh, than the Democratic Party. But both parties were kind of committed to America's network of alliances and so on. And we started to see a lot of, um, you know, undermining of that in uh, in recent years, and a lot of that has been channeled through um, Donald Trump. But it's not it's not just, uh, you know, since uh, Donald Trump uh, arrived on the on the scene. I think the the Russians realized a long time ago that um, there was a strong isolationist tendency in American politics. And they kind of figured out that that was probably that could probably be more effectively mobilized within the Republican Party than uh, in the Democratic Party, because the Democratic Party, uh, they, they, they have a much more kind of altruistic ethos, which um, makes them feel they have some sort of obligation to um, defend all these so-called uh, you know, inverted commas, lesser nations. What what are the vectors, or who are the vectors for Russian influence in American politics? Well, they, uh, you know, it's it's quite a complex thing what the Russians have been doing, but they've obviously been using the uh, the possibilities of social media uh, to kind of polarize various uh, you know societies that they feel are opponents of their of Russian power. And uh, the alt-right was a big part of that. And uh, they seem to be quite active on the left side of politics. You have people like Caleb Maupin, who is obviously a complete shield for Russia on the left side. So, you, and, and I would even say that um, the, the kind of libertarian party, which, um, and uh, the Ron Paul campaign a few years ago, that was a kind of uh, early foray by the, uh, the Russian deep state to uh, kind of throw a spanner in the works. So, I think uh, they, you know, it's not too difficult to do. If uh, if you're a, if you have a major operation like a country uh, that like Russia can mount, then you can you can have a massive effect on controlling what's trending and what's not. You can use enormous amounts of uh, bots and bot traffic to really boost certain messages and make make certain people think that they're getting uh, 
some kind of uh, purchase on the public discourse. And uh, it's quite easy to, uh, to use certain very, very divisive uh, issues to whip up uh, various kinds of uh, feelings, which can then be uh, weaponized in various ways. So there's clearly been a lot going on, at, uh, I would say, certainly since um, 2014. I think at that time, Russia really kind of decided to go to war in a very metapolitical sense. And uh, there is so much evidence of that. And also you see um, something similar with China. And China has got enormous leverage over somebody like uh, Elon Musk. And you, you, say, you see the way that Elon Musk behaves. And he looks like he's really been um, kind of manipulated by um, the, le the leverage that the Chinese have on him as well. So there's a lot of this going on. And the, the West is much more... Uh, naive about this. In a, in a sense, our uh, deep states are much more shallow. They're much more hidebound. They're not allowed to um, break certain rules or do certain things. In a, uh, a country like Russia, a country like China, their deep states have a you know they have a they have carte blanche to do what the fuck they like, really. Now, if uh, China invaded Taiwan. Would uh, Japan join with the United States and Australia in defending Taiwan against China? Well, I think the possibility of China invading Taiwan has kind of diminished. And I would say it's, it's diminished mainly because of what we've seen happen to the Russian Navy in the uh, present Ukrainian war. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Russians started out um, the war against Ukraine quite strong on the in the um, in the naval arena, they completely dominated uh, the Black Sea. They were landing on Snake Island and so on. There was fears of an amphibious landing near Odessa. And it looked like, oh, God, the Russian Navy is coming. And, uh, you know, watch out. Uh, since then, of course, uh, the Ukrainians have kind of got on top of uh, the Russian Navy. And they've done this without a, an actual Navy of their own. They've done it using these various kinds of sea drones and uh, uh, kind of highly accurate missiles, and they've they've um, they, they appear to have destroyed at least a third of the the Russian navy, and the the, the rest of the the Russian navy in the Black Sea is kind of like uh, uh, in hiding, and I think because of um, the you know because of the technical um, evolution of naval warfare that we've seen in uh, just the last couple of years. Uh, the Chinese must be drastically rethinking any um, amphibious invasion plans that they have for Taiwan. Hmm. And how how much of a threat is is China perceived in Japan? Well, it's bloody massive, and it's right next door. So you know, um. And they're led by uh, this guy, Xi Jinping, who's pretty much, a, you know, he's up there with Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong as somebody who can, you know, call the shots and uh, do whatever the fuck he likes. So there's, there's very few restraints upon the leadership uh, in the case of uh, like North Korea and China. So this is this is also very concerning, like if. If um, somebody, if the Japanese prime minister decided to uh, invade some country, uh, a lot of people would um, be very quick to pull him up quite short. And that's not really, really the case with China and North Korea and these other um, societies which are run by these dictator type figures. So there is a lot of potential for uh, China to, to make trouble. So I think the, the Japanese have been kind of over-relying on America to um, provide, you know, suitable backup and uh, security. And uh, like I said earlier, you know, they're, they're just starting to question that and uh, thinking like uh, probably time to, um, you know, kind of dust off the old samurai swords again. Anything about the Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens dust up that has caught your attention? Not really, no. Um, I think for me, Ben Shapiro is a comical figure, you know, and Candace Owens is this incredibly stupid woman who um, 
sort of typifies America, really. Um, the whole of America has been, uh, well, I mean, there's, there's this large section of the American uh, population, which is just, uh, I don't know what it is. They're just like um, uh, very limited in in their in in how they view the world. They, so it's kind of quite easy to trick them into believing all sorts of really deeply flawed, moronic, retarded ideas. Um, and uh, you know, you, you see this exemplified in somebody like Candace Owens. You know, she she seemed like a few years ago she seemed like a kind of um sense sensible enough black woman who could grasp some you know of the key basic political issues and um speak on them you know tolerably, uh, tolerably enough and then she's just um as part of the the dissident right she's just been sucked into all this kind of QAnon conspiratard uh Donald Trump fucking nonsense and uh you know she's she's practically up there with david ike at the moment from what i can tell and, and how again mm, again the sort of um the real thing that underlies everything is um it's, it's anti-semitism uh, or various um derivatives or forms of anti-semitism that uh, these people always kind of latch on to and I, you know, like for me, I think anti-Semitism is like this big ball of string that uh, simpletons can use to connect up all the confusing pieces of the universe. And uh, how, how prevalent are wacky conspiracy theories in Japanese political discourse? Well, the, the Japanese have a lot of wacky conspiracy theories, but it doesn't seem to filter into politics quite as much. I mean. Uh, you know there are there are um there are, there is the kind of moody connection and so on but uh you know that's more like a kind of uh, backdoor funding kind of uh, issue rather than uh, people actually believing in sort of nonsense and then acting on it politically and it's much more of a problem in america you know we have uh, enormous numbers of people who are literally believing the most uh, crackpot ideas possible yeah. And uh, what, what's going on with the dissident right, the alt-right that you that uh, crosses your attention these days? Um, the alt-right, I, th I think, um, I, I don't know, I think people still get nostalgic for it, I th I, it appears. Uh, I don't get very nostalgic for it. I, I regard it as a, a lot of, uh, you know, wasted time and effort, really. But uh, some people do still get um, nostalgic for it. Uh, I've noticed, um, you know, you've heard of Walt Bismarck. No. He used to, used to do these Disney parody songs with uh, alt-right lyrics. Okay. And make funny videos and um, so on. And uh, he's, he's now on Substack and... Um, He's got this idea of uh, alt-right 2.0, which he's trying to get off the ground. Um, so some people seem to think uh, the alt-right was a good thing. And, you know, um, I, I just think it was a kind of wasted opportunity uh, more than anything. There, there was a, a legitimate uh, basis for a radical critique of Western society. And it would have happened anyway, I think, this radical critique of Western society, because there are very fundamental problems with Western society and the uh, overall direction of our civilization. But uh, the alt-right came along and kind of glommed onto that and then just grifted off it and exploited it and turned it in all the worst possible directions, usually with the, the help of the, uh, the FSB in Russia. Now, in the United States and in Europe and Australia, there's a lot of conversation about young men seeking meaning and often finding it from podcasts. Is there a, a thirst for meaning, a search for meaning, particularly among young men in Japan? Mm, not that I've noticed, no. Um, <laughs> I think uh, young Western men they have that kind of uh, kind of crusader spirit when they're young, you know, they're, they're, they want to go out there and, you know, kind of explore the world and uh, challenge the world and remake the world. That's very much a kind of um, 
young Western guy kind of thing, or at least it was in my day. And I, I suspect it still is for a lot of young guys today. Uh, they're just full of beans and they, they, they want to show it and they, they want to kind of do something on the um, kind of global stage and make a big difference. And, uh, you know, this is, this has been probably one of the secrets of the success of the West over the last 500 years. Um, so I, I think it is a kind of uh, uh, one of the uh, aspects of, of youth, really. So right wing discourse, uh, right wing punditry is become increasingly moronic as it appears that the Republican Party has become the low IQ party. I, I think you'd agree that uh, this is a direction we've seen steadily grow over the past eight years. Uh, yeah, I think the probably the Republican Party all, all, uh, always was pretty moronic and the people in it were always pretty moronic, but there were enough kind of clever people in the upper reaches who could control it. And then what's happened, you've had this kind of populist upsurge and that has sort of kind of defenestrated all the, um, the more kind of uh, sensible managerial types, the, uh, the kind of uh, the Mitt Romneys, the Paul Ryans and and so they've all kind of left the party now. And, uh, you know, you have all these kind of Trump tards taken over the party and uh, they've just sort of um, turbocharged the uh, sort of um, the moronic base. Uh, and so, yeah, you have this incredibly uh, dysfunctional Republican Party and it's, it's probably going to uh, go down in flames, I should imagine, in the, uh, the election in November. Uh, there's so many weak points that, um, you know, well-funded uh, Biden campaign with a lot of intelligent people behind the scenes can, can actually hit on. So, you know, um, the, the Republican Party seems to be, uh, you know, heading off a cliff from what I can tell. What do you make of uh, the support for RFK Jr.? Uh, it just looks like one of these very highly suspicious third party operations you know so it's hard to say how it will play out um it could you know i mean he could attract a lot of uh, the idiotic uh, people who support donald trump uh, or it could you know eat into a bit of the um kind of idiotic people who support the democratic party because uh, i mean the democratic party seems to be run by quite clever intelligent people at the moment but it, uh, its voter base is probably just as stupid, if not more stupid, than uh, some of the Republican voter base. So we have a lot of uh, leading podcasters in the United States, such as uh, Joe Rogan and uh, Russell Brand in England and uh, Andrew Huberman in, in California, who've been coming out and talking about their, their experiences with God and the need to have religion for social cohesion. How necessary do you think religion is for social cohesion? I think historically it's uh, been useful for social cohesion. Uh, I think the problem nowadays is that nobody actually believes in it. Uh, you know, all these people who are grifting off it, they clearly don't believe in it. They just think this is a good way to grift off stupid people. That's why they uh, are suddenly becoming religious. Um, and there are a lot of you know, sincerely um, religious people, but most of them are pretty low IQ, I think. Uh, but even the even low IQ religious people, I, I kind of half suspect they don't really believe in their own religion. You know, um, I just I just don't believe in um, people who believe in religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, Japan is overwhelmingly a secular nation. Is that fair to say? Uh, no, no, it's a it's a holy uh, Shinto land. Ah, we're with eight million kamis. So you know, be careful what you say, Luke. Uh, is uh, spiritual seeking a a passion among many Japanese? Are they finding it in gurus, such as in, in the West uh, through yoga gurus or online gurus? Um. Yeah, well, there are there are a few little odd cults in Japan, but um, you know, I think the, the the broad mass of the people, uh, they are slightly 
superstitious. They're slightly deferential to uh, things beyond the kind of material, uh, but they're not. They they seem to have a kind of um, a good um, material spiritual balance where one doesn't impinge uh, too much on the other. How has Japanese society been affected by the Shinzo Abe assassination and increasing scrutiny of politicians receiving money from the the Unification Church of Sun Young Moon? Well, probably not so much. I mean, I think everybody was already uh, on board with the idea that uh, Japanese politicians were a bit dodgy in their uh, financing. So I'm not sure that was a big shock for many people that uh, Abe or people in the uh, the LDP were getting money from the Moonies. Um, of course, um, the unfortunate uh, you know consequences of uh, this uh, this funding stream uh, caused a little bit of a problem. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't really see anything fundamental in it, so I don't think it uh, it will be a, a kind of turning point or anything uh, important. Okay, and uh, the role of, of sports in Japan how how important is it? Uh, we we have increasing number of uh, high profile baseball players now playing for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, Japan seems to have highly competitive uh, baseball league. Is, is the role of sports as a major form of entertainment pretty similar in Japan to, say, England and the United States? Um, mm, I haven't really given it too much thought. I mean, uh, there's a kind of social aspect of sports because, uh, you know, um, when people go to high school and college and they uh, join certain sporting circles and so on there's that kind of aspect which uh, in, sort of uh, enhances social cohesion um with um most of the with the, the the big spectator sports like sumo and baseball and the uh the j league um i guess it's just, it's just a bit of entertainment you don't really see people taking it too seriously uh, you don't really have a big hooligan problem, for example, things like that. Back in Scotland, uh, football's much, much more of a kind of tribal thing. It, it's a very, very divisive part of um, people's identity. It uh, basically prevents a large portion of the population uh, fully assimilating. But uh, in Japan, it's just like... Um, it's just like a hobby thing. It's just uh, a, 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 an area of minor interest for most people. Uh, what percentage and, of? Uh, Sorry, think, go ahead. I think that's why they. I think that's why they like. Uh, that's the, I think that's why baseball is the number one sport because it's a very kind of low intensity sport. Soccer whips up the emotions much more. It's much more. Uh, it's a shorter game. It's ninety minutes. It's much more intense. People get much more excited. With baseball, it has a kind of slow, lazy rhythm, a bit like cricket, really, and uh, that sort of um, that sort of emotional um, tone is more suitable for uh, Japanese people. What what percentage of the Japanese population would be comfortable with what's called hard right nationalism? Well. Um, I don't know. We have to get into definitions here, but um, you could say that uh, most Japanese people are um, by, I guess, by Western European standards, uh, kind of hard right nationalists. Um, they're not too much concerned with the rest of the world. Uh, they are focused on Japan's interests quite a lot. Um you know they're they're playing the hand that uh, history dealt them. I think. Uh, do the do the Japanese by and large regard their 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 rulers as operating in their best interests with regard to COVID? I know that there are many Japanese who believe in COVID conspiracy theories, but I assume that uh, the overwhelming majority of Japanese believe that their ruling class did a good job with regard to COVID mitigation. Oh, 
I don't know. I couldn't really uh, couldn't really comment on that. I mean, that would that would depend on um, very uh, subtle polling, I, I should imagine. But uh, yeah, the Japanese um, did have quite a strong anti-vax culture, shall we say, before COVID. And uh, I actually wrote something about this, and what I figured out was that um, the uh, the rate um, the age, the age at which women were having children was uh, sharply increasing. And so one of the effects of women having children later and later is, is increased uh, autism and uh, other various uh, ailments. And in Japanese society, uh, in order to save face, a lot of uh, these people who were afflicted with uh, this unfortunate uh, outcome they started to assume that it wasn't because they had got married rather late and had children rather late, but uh, this was because uh, their children had been uh, vaxxed. And so they started to blame it on the vax. And this sort of built up a head of steam in uh, you know some of the corners of Japanese society. And it led to certain uh, legal cases. And they actually managed to win a legal case against uh, vaccination and they were paid compensation based upon this and this uh, this frightened a lot of the japanese pharmaceutical companies and they decided not to to get uh, too heavily invested in developing vaccines so when covid came along japan was uh, reliant upon uh, other countries for its uh, vaccines Okay, uh, Colin, uh, good to talk to you, man. It's good to catch up. Yeah, yeah, it's fun to, fun to have a chat after after a few weeks. Okay, All right. I'll talk to you later, man. Take care. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye. Influence our religious beliefs. It's not just a hypothesis. Studies reveal that critical thinking and religious faith are intertwined in complex ways. So, let's embark on this thought-provoking journey together. Picture your brain like a dual-mode engine. Rational thinking and intuition. Intriguingly, people who rely more on intuition tend to have stronger religious beliefs. On the other hand, those who pause to think critically before reacting often lean away from religion. So, does critical thinking obliterate faith? Not exactly. While it can weaken religious beliefs, it doesn't erase them completely. You see, critical thinking might be like trimming the branches, but the roots of faith can still thrive. So, what is the connection between rational thinking and faith? Critical thinking and faith often lock horns. They're like the polar opposites of a philosophical spectrum. Science leans on evidence and proof, while faith embraces beliefs regardless of empirical validation. They might never fully reconcile. How informed individuals approach faith. Interestingly, becoming well informed about religion can sway beliefs. Atheists and agnostics, who often delve into religious knowledge, tend to have less faith. They're like the curious minds who've looked behind the curtain. The concept of faith versus proof. Now, let's address a fundamental question Does faith need proof? For many believers, the absence of proof isn't a concern. Faith operates on a different plane, one of trust, not empirical evidence. The Decline in Religious Beliefs Over time, religious belief rates have been declining. Education and critical thinking are believed to be catalysts for this change. Society's shift towards rational thinking suggests that people now seek moral values beyond religious teachings. In conclusion, in a world where critical thinking flourishes, faith isn't necessarily extinguished. It's a dynamic dance between questioning and embracing beliefs. Right. I earlier read from an academic article by David Vos. I've played his uh, video, Why There Is No Way Back for Religion in the West. He's a, an academic in the United Kingdom. What's happening to God? growing numbers of people around the world to say he's gone away or it doesn't matter or it doesn't exist at all 
and I'd like to understand why. My name is David Vose. I'm a professor of social science at University College London. I do research on religious change in the modern world. You'll be aware that religion is in decline across Europe, North America, and in many developed countries elsewhere. Whether measured by belonging, believing, worshipping, or seeing it as important, religion is losing ground. And those facts corroborate what's called the secularization thesis. The idea, as my friend Steve Bruce puts it, that modernization creates problems for religion, eroding its authority and undermining participation. But what links modernization with religious decline? There have been quite a few suggestions. Once we come into contact with different beliefs and cultures, it's hard to take it for granted that we know the truth and everyone else is wrong. Prosperity gives us the freedom to choose our own worldview. Religion faces competition across all of its traditional functions. We now have secular specialists to heal us, teach us, marry us, counsel us, judge us, and so on. Today I want to focus on God. Some of what I say will come from my own research, but it's also based on decades of work by leading historians, sociologists, and survey researchers, and I'll be citing their books as I go along. The first point to make is that belief in God isn't a simple yes-no matter. We need to consider three distinct but related issues. The first concerns the substance of belief. What sort of God are we talking about? Even in the West, people have different images of God. The second is its salience. How important is our belief, both personally and to society? For some people, faith matters more than anything else. For others, their beliefs really don't make much difference. And finally, there's the strength of belief. Some believers have convictions that are intense and certain. Others are subject to extreme doubt. So there are degrees of belief. But in any case, this God that we do or don't believe in has changed over time. What's also changed is how important he is, to what we do, to how we make sense of the world, uh, to how and by whom we're governed, and so on. But let's start with the substance of belief. Is the Pope Catholic is the epitome of the silly question. But does the Pope believe in God? By the standards of centuries past, perhaps not. The Pope today doesn't believe in a God who sends plagues as a judgment on human sin, who actively supports one side or another in battle, or who presides over an enchanted world of spirits, demons, and everyday miracles. Popular concepts of God are highly varied, but fewer people now than in the past believe in a judgmental deity engaged with everyday life. God has increasingly come to be seen as distant rather than active in the world. The growing distance and abstractness of God has diminished the importance of belief. The end point of the process is doubt, indifference, and outright atheism. The idea that science and technology have reduced the scope for divine action is familiar. It's difficult for us to realize, though, how different the world seemed just 200 years ago before Lyle explained the history of the Earth and Darwin explained the origin of species. Now it's almost impossible for someone raised in a highly developed society to believe in an enchanted world in which God or spiritual forces are constantly interacting with our daily lives. Though American football players seem to credit the Almighty on a regular basis, the situation is different elsewhere. See, for example, Paul Gifford's fascinating account of how pervasive the supernatural worldview continues to be in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, let's... Let's say hello to uh, Claire Kaur. Claire, anything that you've heard on today's show that you'd like to comment on? Uh, yes, yes, so many things. Um, what's his name, The that, that um, UCL academic saying um, people no longer believe in God, but he, he has become an abstraction? Um, David obviously, Vose. he doesn't. Yeah, yes. D David Vose, V-O-A-S. Um, Go ahead. Yes. So, so David Rose is, is obviously an atheist and he's one of these experts telling us to um, give up on the idea. But um, today I, um, I, I got um, a, a Facebook post and it, it actually was so appropriate for Easter Day because it, it showed a jar of um, two rats and, um, and, and it was saying that... Um, they did a psychological experiment on the rat and they they basically dropped a rat in, in a vat of water and they noticed that after 15 minutes it gave up and um, but but it was rescued uh, to prevent it from drowning and, and given a chance to have a bit of a rest and then they put it back in again and it tread water apparently for for 60 hours before giving up um and and this was um to make the point that um a belief that um one might be rescued um gives conviction and strength 
to um, you know whatever we were thinking of doing. But if we if we doubt that we're going to succeed, of course we're we're, we're going to give up at the um, first obstacle. And um, I, I think um, these academics are there to make us give up, and um, we are actually being um, given uh, the opium of the people. Well, I guess opium is now the opium of the people. We're, we're given psychotropic drugs. We are given um, free porn. We are given the idea that we have a right to um, free love, and, and that will keep men quiescent in their matriarchy. And, and believe that there, you know, is no point fighting, and therefore they won't take any any kind of um, uh, reverse um, sacrifice, inconvenience, um, because they they would regard any um, um, loss of status in their lives as as um, something that they cannot possibly put up with. And, and I think um, we are being all demoralized and told there is no hope. So, so give it up and um, try and think of something else more pleasurable than the um, inevitability of our extinction. And uh, what about Stephen J. James? Uh, he seemed to have disappeared from the uh, Internet over the past few months. Have you had any interaction? Do you know what's going on with Stephen? Um, I, I still speak to him. Um, I know that there was somebody call, called Isaac Cade, and he was threatening Stephen, issuing death threats. And recently, um, he was exposed as also threatening academic agent and his um, associates and followers. But but this Isaac Cade person seems to be um, promoting the mainstream um, m mainstream um, view of um, you know um, returning to the EU um, supporting the war in Ukraine and um, I, I don't know may maybe he is a state agent or something but um, um, I think after being threatened um, Stephen has not um, been streaming but I don't wow. know I haven't lost him I, I mean I did sort of say I hope you're okay and you you, you know and he said he's fine but, but I don't know, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's been going on with your own uh, streaming life? Well, I'm spacing a bit more now. And, and I, I do think uh, Spaces has, has more educated people and, and is, is just more, you know, dissident right friendly. And I, I've had a few more ideas. I've got a sub stack now. And... Um, yeah, I, I've had a few ideas about how to um, <laughs> um, get things done. At, at the moment, I'm, I'm talking to this um, Chinese person who um, doesn't like secular Quranism, but, but actually um, is, is a kind of fanatic of Marxism um, in, in the same way that, you know, liberals would say, no, 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 we can't have religion. All religions have to come under the protective umbrella of, of liberal values. And, and he's sort of saying that all religions have to come under the protective value of, of um, socialism with, with Chinese characteristics. And, and, you know, I keep telling him that, that really Marxism is his religion, but he says, no, no, no. But, but I think uh, this, this reminds me of, of Confucius, who, who, who actually had this idea of rectification of names. And he was basically saying a lot of people use words in the wrong way without actually, um, you know, understanding their, their, their meaning. Um, and, and this might have um, implications for analytical philosophy about, you know, you know, do we really know what we mean when we use big words like, I don't know, idolatry or liberalism or conservatism or Christianity? Um, most of us don't really know the full implication or the history behind it, but, but we kind of use these big words to protect us. Um, you know, big words including, you know, accusing people of being, you know, fascists, Nazis, because, you know, th these are ideas that um, perhaps in the process of historical materialism, we get behind and um, use as, um, you know, am ammunition and missiles, you know, to use on the other side. How important do you think religion is for national cohesion? Absolutely important because, you know, what I've been trying to do recently is to tell Americans that, like, look, 
all the problems of the West come from you. You don't have an official religion. You don't even have an official moral system, which at least the Chinese do because they call their moral system you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And if you don't have a, a moral system, which basically means um, you know, a narrative, values, and, and a list of rules, you, you will be at the mercy of your legislature, legislature i.e. parliament or congress because congress can make up the rules as they go along and, and in effect congress has the, the 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 powers of an absolute monarch over the american people because they can change the laws right you, you know and then they can um, appoint whoever they want uh, um, into the u.s supreme court and and you know, interpretation is, is not a function of truth, but that of power, as Nietzsche said. So, so if they control the judiciary and, and the executive and the legislature, we as citizens have, will, will never win because the system is, is rigged against us. And, and you know, we, we just have to understand the, the range of um, forces against us. And, and if we don't even understand the real problem, which is the lack of an official moral system for the Americans, um, there will be trouble. And, and I, I think this is a problem, you know, all this LGBT and, you know, global homo, it comes from America. And um, the Constitution doesn't really protect Americans because, you know, it, it's up to the judiciary to find in favor of, well, in, in this case, um, the government. And, and so the question becomes, you know, what moral system should we have? Because, yes, in theory, we can have, you know, the most perfect moral system. But if in practice, the people in charge are corrupt, um, they're always going to fight against us. And, um, and, and, and also the, the idea of ultra vires, which is um, Congress exceeding the bounds of um, what 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 you know what is constitutional um is you know what will always be the problem because you know again it, it's a you know the ruling classes who will be controlling the judiciary and, and 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 really what i'm trying to say is that you know just supposing um all america i mean america had the official moral system of nazism so everybody knows what a nazi is they don't like jews are going to be mean to them etc and so everybody understands that so if congress were to suddenly say um we're going to be nice to jews now we're gonna let them go first we have to marry them and we have to worship them or something you know everybody would know that something has gone wrong and, and congress is changing the values of the you know american nazi people in this hypothetical situation and and this i think having a moral system is the only way of making our legislature accountable otherwise they, they'll just be able to keep making up the rules as they go along at our expense okay uh, claire i'm gonna move on do you, do you have any final words any additional point that you'd like to make um no, not really. Um, I, I was hoping you'd, you'd ask me difficult questions, but if, if you're not, I, I guess um, um, I, I've just been giving a lecture. All, all right. Um, well, well, thank you for, for having me. And um, I wish you were. Uh, oh, I can't wish you a happy Easter because you're, you're, you're no longer Christian. <laughs> I can wish you a, a happy Trans Visibility Day, which is also um, Easter Day. OK, take care, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, I read a terrific article in Foreign Policy magazine column by Harvard International Relations professor Stephen Walt. came out March 21st and summed up by the headline, the United States has less leverage over Israel than you think. So many American Jews are frightened by the Biden administration, think the Biden administration is turning on Israel. Now, I do think there is a long-run trend that will result in less American support for Israel. But for, the, for right now, right, I think uh, American support for Israel is rock solid. But how does the United States have so little leverage over Israel? And uh, Siva Walt says, Biden's critics assume the United States has enormous leverage over Israel. And just a firm word from President Biden, combined with threats to curtail or halt U.S. aid, would quickly force Israel to change course. And so many people I talk to in daily life have this very opinion. But it's not true, right? Weaker states frequently refuse to comply with U.S. demands. 
and they frequently get away with it. All right, Serbia rejected NATO demands at the conference in 1999. Iran and North Korea have endured, endured sanctions for decades and remain defiant. Nicolas Maduro is still in power in Venezuela, and Bashar al-Assad still rules in Syria, despite earlier U.S. insistence that he must go. So these leaders are able to defy U.S. pressure, and it's because they're not dependent on American support. But close U.S. allies sometimes resist U.S. pressure too. Germany did when it kept building the Nord Stream 2 pipeline despite American objections. Even highly dependent clients can be stubborn. Afghan leaders repeatedly failed to implement reforms demanded by American officials. Ukrainian commanders rejected U.S. advice when planning, advice when planning their ill-fated counteroffensive last summer. Kabul and Kyiv were almost totally dependent on U.S. material support, but Washington still could not get them to do what it wanted. And Israeli leaders from David Ben-Gurion to Benjamin Netanyahu have frequently resisted U.S. pressure on numerous occasions. So the amount of leverage that the U.S. possesses at any given moment depends more than the, on the sheer magnitude of American largesse. So we shouldn't automatically assume that a phone call from Joe Biden and a threat to cut off U.S. aid would get Israel to do America's bidding. So when you provide a client state with military and financial assistance and diplomatic protection and give other benefits, right, you do have some leverage if you have a near monopoly on the aid being provided. And if you care as much as the client about the issues at hand, and there are no domestic obstacles in the client state to change things. But your leverage decreases if a client state can get similar help from somewhere else or if it cares more than its patron about the issues in dispute, which Israel clearly does with regard to Hamas and Gaza, and if uh, the client state, such as Israel, is willing to pay the price of reduced support, or if the patron simply cannot reduce its support due to domestic or institutional constraints, which I think is true in the United States. So many client states are able and willing to defy their patron's preferences, just like many employees are willing and able to defy their boss's preferences. So if a patron believes that a weaker ally is intrinsically val valuable, for example, it might be located in a vital strategic location, it might share similar values. If the client's success is tied to its patron's reputation, then the patron will be reluctant to cut a client off, even if the client is defiant. So the United S Soviet Union had a lot of trouble keeping its various Arab clients in bay, right? Because they were critical to Soviet influence in the Middle East and the Kremlin did not want them to fail or to realign with the United States. The U.S. could not pressure South Vietnam or Afghan leaders by threatening to withdraw its support because it knew that these clients would collapse if they did. So Washington does have potential leverage over Israel and the barriers to using it are lower than they are in the past. But because Israel remains highly resolved on taking care of Hamas in Gaza, Credible threats to reduce U.S. support will not lead Israel to auto course. All right, back to conspirituality on Andrew Huber. Being had by a wellness scam, I think that's really good science communications. And I think it can't help but to push the needle back towards, well, maybe we should remember that there are experts out there in medicine. And oh, yeah, public health is actually a thing. Yeah, it's really important. And also, I'll reiterate that a lot of people who work in that space also understand that there's a lot of problems with the healthcare system, they're not shilling for it. They're actually trying to reform it. I think that's really important to point out. But what companies like AG1 do is exploit those fears and misunderstandings of that. Talking about uh, Andrew Hume as very dodgy sponsors. Space. And I'll also add that I've received a lot of pushback from people saying, Andrew Huberman is a scientist. And yeah, that's true, but he's not a chemist, dentist, or clinical nutritionist, but he speaks freely on those topics. People also say he always includes links on his shows, to which my reply is, yes, again, true, but have you read the studies? Because <laughs> I do. That's what I do for this podcast. I go in and read them, at least some of them, and what he says and what he links to doesn't always match up. But by providing an illusion of research, just like AG1 is doing in my estimation, he gets away with a lot. Okay, so that's the science or the pseudoscience side. But three weeks ago, we also noted that Huberman, alongside Joe Rogan and Russell Brand, had recently jumped on the Confession of Faith bandwagon. So here we have three secular-coded, heterodox brofluencers 
all pivoting towards Jesus as some kind of final boss of the content uh, multiplayer video game. So this meshes in tightly within our beat because when you blend charisma, conspiratorial thinking, and pseudoscience claims, there's a really clear pathway to audience-captured Christianity. But what was your takeaway from that, Derek? Yeah, that's really well put, and I, I do take away what you just said. And we also knew that the Huberman story was going to be coming when we recorded that episode, and I did drop a little hint in there, yeah. speculating if Huberman was shoring up the base with his spiritual confession. And honestly, I don't know his intentions, but if you know a major article about your far-reaching infidelity and your apparent lying to women is going to be published, and he did know because Kerry in New York Magazine did contact him. The God route is a tried and true method. It's pro. Okay, uh, Curious Gazelle has a critique. She says 40 reacts to the Conspirituality podcast. Reaction to Joe Rogan's podcast number 2113 with Chris Rufo on the importance of religion. I have come to a successful characterization of Luke Ford's predictable patterns. I've isolated his core analytical paradigms and reference points. All right, so the following eight-minute clip is an excellent condensation in which you can hear all of them. Nature versus nurture, social networks, Schmidt's concept of the political myth function versus what's actually true, religious function, methods for ascertaining truth, gut instinct versus appealing to experts, hero systems, name drop, Dennis Prager. Luke Ford much prefers analyzing. He much prefers an academic analysis versus gut instinct and pseudo-religious analysis. This content is the primary analysis. Ford enjoys showing a sophisticated pushback against academic analysis. This is a religious believer. He sees its limits. He understands religious people well, but he tends toward a dismissal of the knee-jerk ways of the primary analysis. So he is a tertiary analysis. Luke Ford constantly refers back to these two academic podcasts, Conspirituality and Decoding the Gurus. He also refers back to Steve Saylor's appearance on podcasts because Saylor offers rigorous secular academic analysis. I like it active forgiveness. And given the responses that I've seen to the article on social media, I'm guessing that moment when he was talking to Cameron Haynes about God, I think it did have some impact of that nature. Well, and also, I mean, we could be generous and imagine that knowing this was coming might force him to his knees, like earnestly clutching <laughs> a rosary uh, while having his spokespeople and lawyers preparing for war. So uh, turning to Howley's investigation for New York Magazine, we find this piece that is broad in scope, but it's also granular in detail. And I think we both agree that she nails Huberman's outsized persona and maybe even his soul to the wall with one of the best nut graphs we have ever read. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, as a journalist, this is one of those moments where you're just like, oh, you, you nailed it. Okay, quote, Huberman sells a dream of control down to the cellular level, but something has gone wrong. In the midst of immense fame, a chasm has opened up between the podcaster preaching dopaminergic restraint and a man with newfound wealth, with access to a world unseen by most professors. The problem with a man always working on himself is that he may also be working on you. Dang. So yeah, um, Howley's <laughs> discovery of Huberman's control issues begins with that public-facing zone of optimization through this regime and that regime, through the athletic greens, through the constant monetization of his hero's journey story. And her account of this is exemplary, and we're familiar with it. What we didn't know is how Huberman has allegedly treated the women in his life. And Howley's able to show in excruciating detail how the bro doctor was really good at optimizing deception and domination. And she tracks six of his partners, interviews five, all of them hidden from each other until they started finding each other and talking to each other. And they all say that they were made to feel special, centered, uh, and trusting enough to have unprotected sex with him. Yeah, look, like I said, this story has been in process for months. And in that time, I've talked to a number of people in Huberman's orbit. And I understand journalistic guardrails are necessary and really important, but we've even seen in Reddit forums and in replies on Twitter, many more claims. So let's just see if any future reporting bears out any more problems with this larger story. Yeah, well, right. Uh, you're going to find more and more evidence of 
what a, a fraud Andrew Huberman is. Well, and that's going to depend in part on the backlash that we're seeing now, because what his stands are actually doing is showing other potential interviewees what will happen to them if they speak. Now, one of the most notable points in the story is that his primary partner, Sarah, now all of the names are... Okay, I'll skip that. There's an excellent uh, conspirituality podcast episode on coaches coaching coaches so you don't need many credentials to be a life coach i'm gonna go uh life coaching is big business but we're gonna cover a range of coaches uh, according to market research the life coaching industry was worth 1.5 billion dollars in 2022 in america and it's considered one of the fastest growing industries here and i know i'm talking to two canadians today but i am pulling american statistics right uh, the international coaching federation has reported more than 26,000 coaches in all of north america in 2020 but really those numbers are hard to qualify given that you don't need certifications to become a life coach or really any type of coach. Um, life coaches, business coaches. So there are many benefits from a lack of regulation. All right, you get more possibilities, you get more entrepreneurship, but there are also a lot of dangers with a lack of regulation, particularly see the dangers of lack of regulation in rehabilitation centers where they don't have sufficient staff, sufficiently trained staff, sufficient uh, medical staff on hand. And so people die because so many rehab centers are just run in a just a slipshod, uh, haphazard way. There are many benefits to large group awareness training, such as what uh, Tony Robbins and other gurus like that offer. But there are many dangers, right? That you can have a radical change in personality or behavior. So I compiled a series of, of links about uh, six dangers of large group awareness training. I'll put in the description. So change is normal. But radical change, right, can be quite dangerous. People often lapse into severe depression or anxiety. They go through post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, in yoga classes, uh, sometimes people will involuntarily get a realignment from a yoga teacher that does substantial damage to them. And then people can join in a frenzy in these large group awareness therapies that uh, takes them to a new place in life. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. Frequently, large group awareness training leads to confusion about what is reality, what's not reality, right? So large group awareness training and human potential seminars are designed to transform the way that you view and relate to the world, transform the way you relate to the task at hand. But this can result in a massive break between the individual and everything that is previously understood to be true and to be valuable. So, yeah, sometimes great thing. Frequently, incredibly, incredibly dangerous thing. All right, coaches, coaching coaches. This fertility coaches, quantum coaches, that's a thing. Uh, every industry seems to have an increasing number of people who want to tell you how to do your job effectively, magically, or even quantumly. And let me flag off the top. I don't have an issue with coaches. I've worked for a few startups in my time where founders have hired executive coaches. They were pleased. I worked with them directly. They were wonderful. Uh, there was an outside coach that I worked with at a fintech company, and he provided real-world insights into our marketing strategies. So this episode is not a coaching takedown, but... I've noticed, and I know Mallory, you've noticed as well, that there's this uptick of coaches selling coaching courses. We have a wave of people who spun up coaching businesses with either no training or minimal and questionable certifications. Their entire business model seems to be training other coaches, and we don't know if they have any real-world experience actually coaching people, especially in the industries that they're in. It kind of reminds me of the yoga teaching glut that happened in the late aughts. Yeah, were, absolutely. Yeah, right. there were there were more and more yoga teachers. And so more yoga teachers started holding teacher trainings to train more teachers. So w when you go to yoga, often you get recruited to take teacher training, right? They, they get you into a funnel and uh, yoga class will typically cost something like $10, but then the teacher training will cost $3,000. And then there are different levels of so the yoga teacher training. So you could end up spending tens of thousands of dollars. So uh, more, more warnings about large group awareness training. All right. Uh, there, 
not just the, the radical changes in behavior, but uh, it's something you can never take back, all right? You do the fire walk in the presence of a super guru like Tony Robbins, all right? It's designed to be an event that will permanently change who you are, right? That's the intent. They're going to put you into a peak state, and then they're going to fuse you with similar people who are also engaged in this sacred and peak experience, and this gets interwoven and fused with your connection with the guru. So he will enter the most sacred spaces in your psyche, perhaps for the rest of your life. He wants to change who you are by creating an event that is a turning point in your life. Now, I'm sure Tony Robbins has done a lot of good. I'm sure he's done a lot of harm. I, I can't weigh them up to determine whether he's done more good than harm. I did Kundalini yoga for two years. Uh, Kundalini yoga appears to have had a highly destructive effect on thousands of lives and a highly beneficial effect on thousands of lives. I did thousands of dollars of permanent damage to myself by doing Kundalini yoga. I spent thousands of dollars on physical therapy to try to re reduce the, the damage, but uh, some, of, some of the harm that, that I suffered from doing Kundalini yoga is uh, permanent. So you go to many of these guru seminars and they're filled with embedded commands where they're trying to influence your unconscious mind. So the guru will define what is success for you, right? And uh, it will be filled with group call and response and yelling yes to the commands of the guru. There will be commands to write this down. You'll hear people falling into groupthink and follow the leader as each of his commands is laid in. The seminar will likely be filled with his stories, which are designed to manipulate you. He'll do a type of Ericksonian hypnosis on you. He will deliberately confuse you. And this will often be misused for purposes of increasing his power and influence and money, but not necessarily aligned with your own best interests. So the guru says he's doing it all for your own good. But uh, large group awareness trainings are seriously dangerous, right? They, are, they are, tend to be coercive, right? You, you will not have the courage to stand up against everyone in the room. They will mess with your mind. You may never be the same person again. They are, you can call them sinister and powerful. Yeah, miracles, breakthroughs, personal transformations. You will likely experience an escape from reality. You will likely enter into a realm of magical thinking. And uh, miracle equals instant change, all right? We all fantasize about an easy way out, and these gurus exploit that fantasy. And supply quickly outpaced demand. I mean, we're all coach, we're all yoga instructors here, right, Mallory? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Because making a living teaching group classes is very difficult. And I taught up to 20 a week at one point in my career just to make ends meet. So teachers realized they could make a lot more money leading teacher trainings. And with that phenomenon came a lot of disappointed, newly minted yoga instructors who believed their passion was going to change the world and their bank account. And it did, just not in the direction that they thought it would manifest. <laughs> and so there's also another question I want to ask as we proceed. What happens to trained professionals who are highly educated and heavily regulated in a world full of coaches who just say they're coaches and then can start up a business? So I have a close friend who worked as a psychotherapist and she was a social worker. She was clinically trained to deal with people with mental health conditions. And I know what she was earning and it was modest. And she was really frustrated when people just spun up marketing sites claiming to coach people that can help them with their mental health issues. This doesn't sound legal and it's probably not, but it definitely exists. And these same coaches were bragging about their multiple six-figure salaries. Now, again, I'm not criticizing people who find help from unregulated, uncertified coaches. There's a whole world out there, people of expertise beyond sometimes what their bio will show. But what happens when those people run into real problems with their clients or they turn their clients away from getting actual help when they really need it. I have all of the same questions. So you may think a normal, well-balanced person is not going to be vulnerable, but there will be times in life where we are vulnerable. I remember one psychiatrist made the point that life is a spiral staircase and that we will always move between states where we feel a sense of mastery, states where we feel alone in a big world, states where we're helpless, right? We get sick, our back goes out. And then states where we have a vastly exaggerated sense of our own abilities, all right, grandiosity. And so we just keep oscillating between these various states. 
and we're all going to have states where we're vulnerable and people will come along frequently and take advantage of our vulnerability. Now, if you're fused, tied in, or strongly connected with, with other people in a healthy way, with a community, you're going to be much less likely to this type of manipulation. Derek, I also just want to add, as someone married into a family of psychotherapists, that as far as I understand it, the regulations that they work so hard to you know achieve and, and maintain. Does all this uh, business need to be regulated by academics? No, but I think we benefit from taking accurate feedback and criticism seriously, whether that feedback and criticism and critique comes from academics or from a plumber, right? So outside perspectives are important. The good life depends upon an in-group identity. The ties that constitute an in-group identity will inherently blind us to what's really going on. And so to function optimally, I think we need to both have that strong in-group identity and also be able to step outside of our in-group identity at times and ask ourselves, how is what I'm doing and saying? How, how, how is how my group is operating? How is that going to be perceived by outsiders who don't have an agenda? Right? Disinterested, objective outsiders. How is this going to come across? Focus mainly on the ethics of therapeutic relationship which are at the core of psychotherapy. So when we're talking about coaching, I think most of the time we're talking about advice and counseling, where the premise is that the client needs some kind of expert information about their lives or you know, the, the task they want to perform. Maybe they need cheerleading. And the basic orientation is, I'm successful, I know how to be successful, and I can teach you how to be successful too. And that's a kind of hierarchy that runs counter to the basics of therapeutic relationship, which takes years of training uh, and one's own therapy to, to understand. And I think in this episode, we're going to be seeing the downstream effects of that gap. Yeah, totally. So let's peel back the quantum curtain of coaching and see what isn't inside. <laughs> You are obsessed with personal development, have been through a profound transformation of your own, and you have that calling inside that says, I want to help other people. I want to be the catalyst for change. I want to be a coach. Scaling your coaching business from 5 to 30k months can feel impossible these days because the market is so saturated online. Let's talk about marketing in 2024 for a six-figure year. If you're an ambitious coach that knows you're capable of making over 30k per month and know you're also a great coach but you just can't figure out how to scale and have the impact that you really want, I need you to follow me here so I can help you. This week I spontaneously created and sold a bundle for 200 it generated over $15,000 in 24 hours. I just closed out 34K with my brand new offer and it's no big deal. $10,000 in 10 days. Steal my exact formula for doing $120,000 sales month with no team. If you are a practitioner, healer, or coach, and you're struggling with getting people to return for their sessions, it's actually a good time. It's a book, it's script. If you're a hypnotherapist and you wanna reach a consistent 10K every month in your hypnosis business, then I want you to follow me here on Instagram. Oh man. Hello listeners, it's 2024. Everyone has become a coach. We're all just coaching other coaches. The only classes are master classes. We're all a number figure business owners. It is illegal for prices not to be angel numbers, and we exist simply to level up. <laughs> Everything is either divine feminine or divine masculine. There's containers everywhere. All clients are aligned, dream, ready, and fuck yes clients. We love <laughs> adjective clients. There's conflict over whose quantum is the real quantum, and your business is either soul-led, heart-led, spirit-led, or all of the above. This is the reality the coaches who coach coaches sound like they live in. You know, the first person in that montage clip, um, I just want to point out this appeal to, well, you really want to help others. There's something so incredibly sad about that because it is speaking to something real in the culture, of course, which is just sort of mass neglect. And I love the jargon uh, that we're going to learn, but what is the containers part all about, Mallory? <laughs> yeah. 
Containers is so there's containers everywhere. There's so many containers. Uh, container just seems to be another way to say offer. I think it par- is partially a way of making it sound less salesy going mm, from yeah. buy my thing to join my container. <laughs> <laughs> it also adds like a community aspect to it, suggesting that there will be yeah. others in said container. Of course. And I think it suddenly makes it seem more exclusive. You're not just signing up for a course. Uh, You're being invited into something that maybe requires an application process, which some of them do. It does make me laugh every time I hear it, though, because all I can think of is my Tupperware drawer. Yeah, you know, and to me, it also sounds like a pseudotherapy weasel word because it allows the coach to avoid saying what they will do, right? Because there's this fallback to describing, you know, uh, the fact that I'm going to be providing space in which something undefined can happen. So... I don't know, maybe it's a way of setting up the client from the outset to be responsible for whatever happens during the process, because all the coach did was to provide a container. Definitely. And uh, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing. This intentional word choice likely also plays a role in the no refunds aspect (laughs) a lot of these offerings have. The container I spend the most time in is my second Instagram where I follow folks who I don't want infecting my own personal algorithm. I'm pretty upfront about that. And one of my favorite things about this is seeing what ads meta will serve me. It's not entirely difficult to puppeteer, but it did catch me off guard last year when I started getting ads for coaching programs. At the time, I was predominantly following pseudoscience and conspiratorial grifters, but for some reason, meta assumed I was also a coach in need of coaching. (laughs) Of course. And because I have a disgusting amount of curiosity, I spent time on those ads, which told meta to feed me more and more of them. I'm not a coach in need of coaching, but I do have a background and deep interest in marketing, something coaches who coach coaches seemingly spend a lot of time and money on. And because marketing on social media seems to be where this industry dominates, that's where I want to start. If you are a female coach who knows you want to grow your business, but you're starting to feel the burnout of being plateaued somewhere between 10 to 30K a month, you don't know exactly where your next ideal clients are going to come from. Then follow me and go back through all of our past free content because I have given you a simple feminine marketing funnel that has helped me hire a world-class team for my multi six-figure business while working less than four days a week. This is the same exact funnel that our client Leslie used to hit her first 50K month this year and Allison, who just hit a 73K cash month. The feminine funnel? <laughs> the f- the fem- okay, so what's the actual coaching content here and does it involve enemas or something? like? And also the expectations are wild. Seven. Have you been caught in the uh, the feminine funnel? Right, that won't do it for me for 